Good afternoon. I'm Leonard Baines, Dean of the University of Houston Law Center, and I want to welcome you to our annual U.S. Supreme Court update. It is one of the things that I'm most proud of that we do because we have a fabulous uh, panel of experts. Many of them are our faculty members, and they're going to be talking about a variety of issues dealing with LGBTQ discrimination and the EOC, immigration law, and asylum issues, uh, faithful or faithless electors, and the electoral college and elections, uh, immigration law, and tax law, and the uh, reach of tax law with respect to presidential tax returns by the US Congress and also by the Manhattan DA's office. So it's really a great opportunity for us to showcase our fabulous faculty, but also to educate our constituents, our alums, our friends about all the great things that are happening, but also in terms of what's happening with the law. So in a, mo in a moment, I want to just talk a little bit about the faculty generally. So we really a top-notch faculty. We have about 57 faculty members. Um, they are very well credentialed. Uh, 23 or more of them are members of the American Law Institute. Uh, they publish lots of books, book chapters, law review articles, and a wide number of them, a wide variety, a number of them have published in the most high ranking law reviews and journals in the country. So I'm very, very proud of the law faculty and of the law school generally. For those who are, are alums, you know, I probably have heard me say all this before. We have a, a great law school. Um, our students are really top notch with the highest credentials of a median LSAT score of 160, the highest in six years, and a median GPA of 3.61, which is the highest median GPA in the law school's history. But at the same time, we've been able to marry that excellence with diversity, where our students of color from underrepresented groups of African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans constitute anywhere over the past five or six years from 35 to 46 percent of the student body. And for the past two years, the women students comprised over 50 percent. So it's a great institution, one that I've been dean for now six years, and a few days will be my six year anniversary as I move into my seventh year. But let me talk to you about the first panel uh, and the panelists. So the first panel is gonna be dealing with uh, the EOC and LGBTQ discrimination. And so we have really a great panel. So it'll be a conversation between uh, Judge Steve Kirkland, who's currently the judge on the three, three, 334th Civil District Court of Harris County. He previously served as judge in the 215th Civil District Court and in Houston Municipal Court. He lectures on communications law and ethics at the University of Houston. His professional career includes representing the city of Houston, international oil, oil companies, and individual homeowners. Judge Kirkland is active in promoting recovery from drug and alcohol addiction, affordable housing, historic preservation, and LGBTQ rights. Uh, his affordable housing projects have been recognized with awards by the Greater Houston Preservation Alliance, and he was awarded the 2006 Government Friend of the Homeless by Coalition of the Homeless of Houston and Harris County. Let's welcome Judge Steve Kirkland. Our sec second panelist is Victor Flatt. Victor Flatt returned the unit to the University of Houston Law Center in 2017 from the University of North Carolina Law School. He is the Dwight Olds Chair in Law and the Faculty Director of the Environment, Energy and Natural Resources Center. He also has an appointment as a distinguished scholar of carbon markets at the University of Houston's Global Energy Management Institute. He's a recognized expert in environmental law, climate law, and energy law, and many of his articles have been highly placed and finalists of, of uh, competitions with respect to honor, um, environmental law. But he's also served as on the National Board of Lam, Lam, Lambda Legal, and the Law School Admissions Council Gay and Lesbian Interest Section. So we're very proud to have two experts on LGBTQ issues discussing 
the most recent Supreme Court cases on these issues. So thank you, and I'm gonna disappear for a moment. And after the, uh, uh, their presentation, I will be back. So thank you. Thank you, Dean Baines, and thank you, Judge Kirkland, uh, for joining uh, today. I, I, before we get started, I just wanna say how proud I am that Judge Kirkland is an alumni of the University of Houston Law Center. He's an amazing uh, judge, uh, has been an amazing attorney. His work in LGBTQ issues has been phenomenal. And yet he's even a great, great judge for environmental cases, which I've noted by seeing some of his opinions before. So thank you for doing this today, Judge Kirkland. Thank you, Victor. It's always uh, fun to be back at my alma mater and uh, at the law school, even if it is virtually. So um, Victor and I have uh, mapped out uh, our course this morning. We have, of course, we're going to talk about the Bostock case, which is both a, a landmark case that's got a great significance as well as in many respects, quite unremarkable. And we will talk about some of that as we get into it. But we thought we would leave with the punchline, which is the holding of the case. Give you a little bit of the story of the people that uh, brought the case. And then Victor and I will enter into a conversation about the uh, history, the context, uh, and what it all means. So without further ado, we'll just jump in. The holding was pretty straightforward. Um, the question was, is uh, discrimination based on LGBT status uh, prohibited by the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act? And the Supreme Court uh, quite convincingly said, yes, it is. Um, by doing that, um, they resolved a split in the circuits. So there was, of course, a split going up, and the question turned around, can you, uh, how do you get to that based on the language of the statute? And the statute prohibits discrimination uh, on the basis of sex, and different circuits had reached conclusions that uh, discriminating based on LGBT status was, in fact, uh, discrimination based on sex. I believe the 11th Circuit is where one of these came out of, and it was no, and then the second and the sixth both uh, said yes. Um, how did they do that? That's a pretty straightforward analysis, and it's frankly the court, and I'll just quote the court because uh, Justice Gorsuch summed it up pretty nicely in, in two quick paragraphs. It's impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discrimination or discrimination against the individual based on sex. Um, to discriminate based on these grounds requires an employee to intentionally, uh, intentionally treat individual employees differently because of their sex. And just in case you didn't get it, uh, Justice Gorsuch gave you a pretty straightforward example. You've got two employees that uh, are, in the employer's mind, are materially identical in all respects, except that one is a man and the other is a woman. Uh, if the employer fires the male employee for no other reason than, uh, than the fact that he's attracted to men, uh, the employer discriminates him or traits that he tolerates in his female employee. And that is discrimination based on sex. Um, pretty straightforward analysis. Uh, we'll pull it apart a little bit when we get into the conversation. Hopefully, Victor will come back and we can do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if some of you have questions, I know there's a way to submit them. Please submit questions so that we can try to respond to those as well. Uh, Gerald Bostock, the guy that got the name, uh, the, gets the lead building in the case, he was a child welfare advocate in Clayton County, Georgia. Uh, he uh, uh, was uh, at least uh, credited by the Supreme Court with uh, leading that uh, department into some national awards. Uh, he decided to play softball. Uh, yes, not all gay people are well, actually, many gay people are actually sports people. Uh, and uh, Gerald was one of those, and he joined a gay softball league and uh, uh, got some, got noticed. Prominent people in the community complained, and uh, he is fired. Uh, Donald Zarda is a New York skydiving instructor. He was our second, uh, second petitioner in the case. Uh, and he was... Uh, 
thought he was doing a nice thing to one of his clients who was uncomfortable or expressed some discomfort about being strapped to a man, a woman being strapped to a man for their tandem skydiving thing. And so he announces and tells her, don't worry, uh, I am a, I'm a gay man, so this is not sexual at all. Uh, and of course, she responds by uh, complaining uh, to his employers about being touched by a, a gay person. Uh, and then he is promptly let go as well. Uh, Amy Stevens, uh, Miss Stevens is perhaps the harshest one. She was uh, a, she's up in Michigan working at a funeral home. And when she started working at the funeral home, she, uh, she presented as a man. Uh, and two years into her job there, she sought treatment for depression. Uh, and the treatment evolved over a period of four years and she was ultimately diagnosed with what's called gender dysphoria and then was recommended that she begin transitioning to presenting as a woman. So on her vacation, she sent a, before she left for a vacation, she told her employer, when I come back, I am going to be presenting full time as a woman. Uh, and presumably she explained the uh, gender dysphoria diagnosis and, and stuff that went with that. She didn't get out the door before she was fired. So we had three people who were fired specifically for LGBT status. Um, one of the court, court specifically said all three of them were unlawfully discriminated against under Title VII. And they used the, each one of those was an instance where they were being discriminated on, on the basis of sex. So Victor, I'm glad to see you back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm glad to be back. Uh, what a world we live in. Uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome where I am and for no reason at all, but thank goodness we, we've got phones too, so. Yay. So this argument that uh, LGBT status is included in uh, discrimination against sex, where did that come from? Well, it's interesting. Um, it started, I mean, I, the, the person I like to trace it to, and I think you know of her as well as Kai Feldblum, oh, who's yeah. A, yeah, uh, who a professor at uh, Georgetown Law School and was appointed to the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission by um, President Obama. Um, now, you all will recall, if you followed uh, LGBTQ law, that for decades now, decades, um, we have been trying to get Congress to pass uh, Fair and Equitable Act, uh, Legal Equality Act, it's gone by many different names, which was essentially to modify um, the non-discrimination laws that currently exist uh, to include uh, non-discrimination based on sexual orientation at first and then sexual orientation and gender identity. And uh, Kai made the point, and, and this had come up in cases before this, but she made the point that as you point out, if, if you are being discriminated against solely because you are a gay man or lesbian, or because you are transgendered, then by definition, you are being discriminated based on sex. How is that? Well, if you're fired because you're a gay man, because you are sexually or uh, affectionately attracted to men, but they would not fire a woman for the same status, then you have been discriminated based on uh, your sex or your gender. Uh, and the same, of course, for um, people with uh, gender identity issues or transgendered people. Um, and this made it sort of into the mainstream, first with transgendered folks, uh, based on some cases about uh, expectations of gender and what kind of makeup people wear and various other things, and it was sort of slow to get started. But once High came on the EEOC, she believed that that should be the official interpretation of the Employment uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and that became the position during the Obama administration. Excellent, excellent. And of course, I think you we the Trump administration uh, changed that interpretation of the EEOC, uh, but now the court has spoken. So the interpretation of the agency is less important than the court saying that the actual words of the statute do include. Um, making sure that there's no discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Now, the court also talks about how the folks that passed the Civil Rights Act probably didn't have sexual orientation or gender identity in their minds when they did that. Um, but that didn't seem important to the court, did it? Not to the majority. 
And, and this is particularly interesting because as, as many of you followed this in the news noted, there was some uproar over the fact that Justice Gorsuch wrote the opinion and it was also joined uh, by Chief Justice Roberts. And essentially um, what's interesting about this opinion is it is the logical extension of a kind of um, legal statutory interpretation known as textualism. Um, and this has generally been supported uh, by more conservative jurists, the idea being that when you look to see the meaning of a statute, you just look to the, the, the text of the statute itself. You don't try to go behind it and then what, look at the intent of the legislature, what they were trying to include or not include, because they should be clear within the text. And the theory behind this is to keep judges from being particularly activists, that they just simply look at the text rather than um, try to understand or put uh, words in Congress's mouth. And so when you look at the text, right, the text is no discrimination based on sex. And if you are fired because you're a man who loves a man, but you're not fired because you're a woman who loves a man, that is by definition discrimination based on sex under the textual, textualist example. Um, so in that sense, it, it's a very interesting opinion in that it does come from sort of conservative jurisdictional principles. I was um, a bit uh, dismayed or interested in the uh, dissenting opinion written by Justice Kavanaugh. Oh, come uh, on, Victor, admit you were annoyed. <laughs> well, I, I, I thought it was a bit of a sophistry. I'll, I'll just put it that way. Uh, because Judge, Justice Kavanaugh has also said repeatedly that he uh, supports the situation in textualism, but then he wrote in his dissent that uh, rather than adhering to literal meaning, that the court needed to adhere to ordinary meaning. Now, I've not seen that distinction in a Supreme Court case before. So uh, it, it's, it's interesting that he brings this up in, a, in an attempt to suggest that while the case based on sex discrimination might literally apply, to persons of differing sexual orientations who are discriminated that way or gender identity, that uh, ordinary meaning of sex does not encompass that. And so he ends up creating sort of, to me, uh, a new distinction out of whole cloth. Um, well, and he's doing what the majority said you shouldn't do with the statutory interpretation arguments, which is try to use the legislative history to introduce ambiguity into a statute. Correct. Correct. They were, they were saying, you can't do that. I mean, first off, there's only like 500 people in Congress and trying to figure out what all of them thought they were doing when they did it is kind of right. hard to do. Right. Uh, and, and then the court also pointed out that some people actually thought they did that because the minute the statute, the, the year the statute was filed, there were cases filed. Uh, Correct. Immediately cases right. were filed. Right. And, and in fact, in, in, when, when there was lobbying going on against passing Title VII, one of the fears that were brought up uh, was, whoa, what about, this is going to give uh, rights to, at that time, lesbians and gay people. I mean, it, it was, it was, that was a threat that was seen at the time, although Congress said, no, it doesn't apply to that, or some people in Congress said that. Right. Yeah. So, um, well, the, Steve... Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to just ask you about this. I mean, you're much more familiar with the existing skein of laws in this in, at the federal level in Texas. So what does this case mean for LGBTQ people who are living in Texas? Uh, we don't have state non-discrimination protection. So does this change what's happening now for uh, people who live in Texas? Yes and no. I mean, if you work for a federal employer like the University of Houston, uh, you're protected. Uh, but, you know, most people don't work for federal employers. Most of us work for small employers, particularly in the LGBTQ arena. Uh, that's where employment has been for us, and that's where our people tend to go. And Texas law does not have uh, non discrimination provisions. So the EOC policy, the ruling from the court doesn't apply unless the statute applies. So you have to right. work for an employer that's big enough for that to occur. I believe so, that's maybe 50. Is it over 50? I think that Tele7 might apply to. Sounds right. 
Um, I have to look up uh, the specific numbers every time uh, somebody cites a statute at me. So um, uh, thresholds are something that for reasons I don't understand, I have a hard time with. But uh, that's why I have rule books and you know, computers to help me remember. Um, so yeah, so the folks in Texas aren't going to be, aren't going to get the benefit of that. And there's actually only 21 states that have non-LGBT uh, as a protected status. Because the court didn't do that, didn't create a new group of, or a class of people that are in protected status. Uh, and they've resisted that throughout their history. I mean, from, they flirted with it briefly in Roma, Romer, but they didn't do it. And every one of our advances have been on the basis of uh, finding a no rational basis to interfere with right. a particular dignity interest. Correct. So, uh, yes. So, that's a, it, it's, it is. It's interesting. And in that sense, this case, this case is so different in a certain way because it's not decided on constitutional grounds. Uh, it's decided, I mean, it could have been, right? In theory, you could have challenged uh, the federal government for not applying it to something, et cetera. But this was simply on statutory interpretation grounds. Um, so some win for us in that if we work for large employers, we may be covered. Uh, but we'd still like to see the state of Texas uh, pass a non-discrimination law that would apply to all workers in the state as well, and as well as other things like housing and, and various other situations like that. So Yeah, now before people start saying, you know, well, surely the Supreme Court decision on this issue is persuasive in Texas, and, you know, to Judge Kirkland, it certainly would be, um, but the Texas Supreme Court has gone out of its way to make sure none of its decisions uh, or any of the statutes that are available uh, can be interpreted as giving protection to LGBT folk for any reason. Um, they were recalcitrant with the marriage decision in the pigeon case, and uh, uh, they're not 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 favorable to advancing LGBT causes. So, uh, folks in Texas may may have some rear guard actions to go, or at least LGBT folk in Texas will have rear guard actions to continue to push for their protection. So. You know what else I think is really interesting about uh, this suite of opinions is I think it shows an acceleration in the education of the justices um, and also the impact that society has on our judges. I, I, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, you're a judge, you're neutral, I understand. But I believe that all of our judges or justices uh, are affected by their own understanding of certain issues. And um, I know that uh, during oral argument for these cases, there were some very strange questions asked um, that- We had to uh, hear about the bathrooms again. <laughs> there was a lot about, well, does this mean we're gonna have to use this bathroom or, or, or the state, or, or we can't, a private organization with over 50 people can't tell someone which bathroom they can use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, there was about that. And then there were even some questions about non-binary issues of gender, which was not even before the court at that time, right? So they're sort of looking at, ah, we don't understand, or, you know, uh, what's this, what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. But when it came down to it, after the opinion came out of some, I guess, eight or nine months after the oral argument, um, the majority sort of just says, you know what, we don't have to answer the question about bathrooms. That question isn't before us. Um, this yeah. is simply a straightforward question about employment discrimination, and that's the question we're going to answer. So even though the dissent still puts this up, oh, this could cause all sorts of harm and this and that, no decisions were actually made on that. And again, this goes, I think, to the continuing understanding of um, gender identity, the continuing understanding of sexual orientation and, and, and what's happening with that over time. Um, I, I would note, I, I don't know how many of you read the New York Times, but there was a very interesting column yes, in yesterday's New York Times in the op-ed that said the importance of social movements. And it noted that, you know, law helps, and that's important, and it talked about the case, uh, the Bostock case, but it said, but look at how social movements and the visibility of the LGBTQ community has changed and influenced uh, these opinions. And then it cited Justice Gorsuch's opinion in the Bostock case. 
And I thought that was a really interesting uh, way to think about it. It is telling yeah. judge the house. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, judges don't don't live in a vacuum. We live in society and we, we are influenced uh, by our experiences and what what we bring to the to the bench. And clearly the Supreme Court is the same. I mean, from you know Justice Powell famously saying he didn't know uh, uh, an LGBT person when one of his clerks was. Uh, when he voted uh, in favor at that time of the anti-sodomy statute in Georgia. Uh, and once he learned of that, he changed his, his, his outlook on that changed very radically, very differently. Right. So, um, so, yeah, visibility of the community has been important for all sides to, to get some grap to grapple with it and to come right. to a better understanding of it. And I think the particularly, you know, we've seen over time an increase in visibility of LGBTQ, LGBT people, but the, the, a, a very major increase in visibility, I think, of trans people and trans issues, and, and now recently also people who don't identify uh, as one gender or, or another. And, and I think the court is right that it will grapple with what these issues mean at the time that it needs to grapple with what these issues mean. Right, uh, but it's, assuming, assuming they ever have to. Right, right. And they like to avoid answering questions if they can avoid doing that. We know that. Um, they teach us that in judge school. <laughs> they do teach you that in judge school, which is good. Um, I, again, I'm on my phone. I can't fully see what's going on, but are there questions that people have uh, from the audience uh, or would like to uh, ask mm -hmm. at this point about these cases? There is nobody feeding questions to us, so it's you and me. And I assume they'll pull the plug on us when we're done. Okay, that sounds yeah. good. All right. Um, so the majority actually, uh, Justice Alito actually, in his dissent, had some very interesting points. And one point that he made, and and, and I think we kind of probably ought to, ought to deal with it, is he was saying these folks weren't discriminating based on gender they were saying they were discriminating based on LGBT status. And so they discriminate equally against lesbians as they do against gay men, against transgender people. Everybody, if it's LGBT, they don't want them. But you know, they love their men, they love their women, and they, you know, so that's good. Where'd you go, Victor? <laughs> I'm here again. Uh, there you go. So yeah. I'm back. Um, so I'm sorry, please continue. So the status question, uh, the basis of the status is LGBT, the basis of the discrimination is LGBT, not gender. And I'm right. curious, um, that was an interesting argument to be making. Um, and well, I, and I, I, go ahead, go ahead. And I think I see it in, you know, kind of the same argument as, uh, you know, uh, hate the sin, but love the sinner. <laughs> well, that's, I think that's one way to look at it. I think the other way I look at it is it takes, it just takes it back to this textualism argument, which is, you know, it, it, you may, you're animus, you know, you, you may have animus toward this person because he is gay. But if your animus has the effect of literally discriminating based on the fact that the same actions of a man should, would, would allow that man to be fired, whereas the actions of the woman would, would not have caused the woman to be fired, then that is textbook sex discrimination. Um, we saw something else like this very briefly um, in the 1990s with the AIDS uh, epidemic, where certain decisions were made um, about uh, firing people um, who, because of their HIV status, um, and it may have been because of their sexual orientation, but because of their HIV status, there was a protection of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so the, the idea is that if you're in the category and the, and the disc discriminatory effect works in that manner, then you are covered by that. Again, that goes back to the textual argument in the, of, of, the, of the majority. And the majority actually, pointed out a couple of decisions that supported that position, the motherhood argument. We don't yeah. discriminate against women, we discriminated against mothers because they cost us money, et cetera. 
Um, and the same thing, there was a pension case that they pointed out in their decision as well. Women live longer, so we have to charge them more. Right. And yet that has the effect of having a discrimination based on gender. Right. And so it is covered and it is included. So you can be in more than one of those categories at the same time. So the, one of the questions is, institutions that receive federal funds, are they going to be covered by this? Victor, do you know the answer to that? So th this, is, this applies specifically to Title VII. What's interesting is whether or not it's, it seems like the reasoning should go over to other federal statutes uh, and also from actions of the federal government in general. So for instance, um, the Trump administration had already taken uh, actions against uh, transgendered people in the military. Uh, and, and that, of course, would seem to run afoul of the interpretation of gender discrimination. Uh, on the one hand, though, you could say, well, this was a textual argument about a statute. And if we uh, apply this to issues uh, that the federal government takes against people in the military, that becomes a constitutional question. Now, if though sex discrimination is sex discrimination for purposes of the statute, it seems like it should also be sex discrimination uh, for the purposes of the Constitution, at least for these particular uh, justices. Um, and so what I, see, what I see about this is that at this point in time, it simply applies to Title VII, period. However, I believe the reasoning extends uh, to, could extend to constitutional cases and other statutory cases as well, such as Title IX uh, in the educational context, which is sort of equivalent to Title VII um, in the private sector context. So I, I, that's how I look at this. So I think there's still work to be done. Um, and given the current administration, I don't see this, gov this executive branch rolling over and, and you know, not doing what they want to do. Uh, so there may be more cases we'll have to be brought. Uh, we have cases currently as well. So I see Dean Baines has reappeared. Okay. <laughs> um, there was one question, Dean, you're, you're still muted. I reappeared because I wanted you to get to the questions. Ah, uh, um, okay. But while you get to the questions, I think there's two more and you have about three minutes, two minutes. I just okay. want to point out a couple of other things, linkages. One is that sex in uh, the statute, what, you know, they added it because they wanted to defeat it, which is really right. interesting. So it's really, you know, because it was focused on principally African-Americans at the time and they wanted to defeat it. So it's, I think it's really important to uh, reference that. And the other thing is, you know, Kavanaugh's dissent, what I find interesting, it back, harkens back to the Thine case, which is an early immigration case. And the question for Thine was whether someone of South Asian ancestry was ca Caucasian, meaning white or not, and the Supreme Court said, well, in our ordinary reading of people of South Asian descent, they are not white, even though technically you know, they are, they, are they might very well be. So it just reminds me of that. So I just appeared so you can answer, I think there's maybe one more question in the Q&A. Okay. Why don't you answer that? I'm, and then we'll uh, move on to the next panel. Somebody could identify that question. I have a hard time seeing them. So somebody uh, else. Sure. Uh, Eleanor Hayes actually asked a good one. She's, she's always thought of these, she says she's always thought of these decisions as kind of piecemeal and continue to deny LGBTQ folks full constitutional rights. And I, I, ha I have to agree with you, Eleanor, on that point. You then jump and say, do we need a constitutional amendment to give us protection? I'm going to jump in and say, I don't think so. I think we're already there. Um, if you look at traditional equal protection analysis, we hit We do have a constitutional amendment, the 14th Amendment. Yeah, we're there. We're there. Um, we hit on all of the, the points for being a protected class. The court just has consistently refused to, to go there. So um, I think that's where we need to go. Or even if you're not... Uh, facing heightened scrutiny on evidentiary basis, the very crux of the Equal Protection Act is that it cannot sanction intentional discrimination solely for the point of discrimination. And Justice Kennedy sort of, I think, brought that out in this series of cases uh, with Romer in particular. Um, so I do think we are getting there and I think progress has been made. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. 
Well, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, thank you, Judge Kirkland and Professor Flatt. It was illuminating and exciting colloquy between both of you. Obviously, very well learned scholars in these issues. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much, Dean Baines. Thanks for so having me. Thank you. So I'd like to now introduce the next set of speakers. We're going to be talking about immigration issues. And so let me introduce them. So our first panelist is Daniel Morales, who joined our faculty about a year ago. He's Associate Professor of Law and the George A. Butler Research Professor. He's a scholar and theorist on immigration law. His research addresses legal problems that arise because immigration law acts on non-citizens. It is made by and for the citizens, citizenry. His scholarships have appeared, his scholarship has appeared in major law, leading law reviews, such as the NYU Law Review, Indiana Law Journal, Wake Forest Law Review. Uh, he came to us as a tenured faculty member from DePaul. We're delighted he's with us. Uh, and he was honored at DePaul for both his teaching and his scholarship. So let's welcome Daniel Morales. Uh, and, and Daniel teaches immigration law, immigration, and Latinos in the law. And then, and Jeffrey Hoffman is our other panelist. So let's welcome Jeffrey. Jeffrey's a full clinical professor of, uh, in the uh, immigration clinic. He specializes in immigration related federal court litigation, deportation defense, asylum cases, and appeals before the Board of Immigration Appeals. He's represented numerous immigrants in a variety of settings including the Executive Office for Immigration Review, the Department of Homeland Security, and the federal courts. Uh, he served as co-counsel in the Supreme Court of the United States, before the Supreme Court of the United States, in a precedent-setting precedent immigration case called Karachi Rosendo versus Holder. He's been a frequent commentator on immigration law and policy in major news outlets. Uh, he uh, also has been the recipient of our Ethel Baker Award for Community Service, uh, University of Houston's Teaching Excellence Award for Clinical Faculty. Um, he's also received uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association Elmer Freed Excellence in Teaching Award. So let's welcome both Daniel, Professor Daniel Morales and Professor Jeff Hoffman. And but one last thing about Jeff Hoffman, he's also co-chair of our Faculty Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I think Professor Hoffman is going first. Is that my understanding? Yes, Dean. Okay. okay. So let me pop out and leave it to our experts. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dean Baines, for, for having me. Um, so uh, I'm going to go first, and uh, Professor Morales is going to talk about the Thurisigium case. Uh, I'll be talking about the DACA decision. Um, I'll be talking for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, obviously, there's a lot to say. Um, and I thought the way that I would structure this discussion is to start with a short overview, uh, situating the decision in, in the history of immigration jurisprudence. Uh, and then I'll move to the procedural history of the case, a little bit about the decision, what it says, and what it doesn't say, uh, and finally, the aftermath. So let's start with uh, situating this, this monumentally important decision, a very important decision uh, on a couple levels in, in the history of immigration jurisprudence. And so when I was thinking about this, um, you know, I think about, you know, a lot of people may not study immigration law, maybe a it's kind of a niche field. Um, so let's think about ways that you can categorize immigration cases. Um, so let's trace some connections. So the, the main, you know, uh, progenitor of immigration cases, uh, the grandfather, if you will, is the Chinese Exclusion Act case from 1882. And what that says is basically that Congress has plenary power over immigration. And the main reasoning there, the short answer is that because uh, of sovereignty. Okay, but nothing express, expressly in the US Constitution says plenary power uh, exists over immigration, nothing expressed, but it's kind of implied. It's implied from the structure of, of the Constitution. Um, and then importantly, in terms of the quote unquote plenary power doctrine, we see various subsequent cases kind of talk about other sources of this power. And so of importance to the DACA decision is one that, that um, 
is, is, is uh, rooted in the take care clause. So if you look at the Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution, the take care clause, um, it requires the president to obey and enforce all laws. Uh, of course, the president also has discretion in, in how federal agencies will interpret those laws. Um, another source um, would be the naturalization clause, but of course that just relates to citizenship and naturalization. Another source would be interstate commerce. And so there, there, there are many different, you know, structurally uh, different ways to, to um, uh, anchor the, the plenary power doctrine. So I think that'll be important, uh, not that it was discussed expressly in the DACA decision, but just be aware of. Um, and now let's think about some other some other uh, parameters that get discussed in, in immigration jurisprudence. So think about, for example, whether the case is a statutory case or a constitutional uh, power case, uh, whether the case involves issues of inadmissibility, which means people uh, coming into the United States, either at a consulate or at a border or at an airport, port of entry, uh, or is it a case about deportability, which is what are the rules to expel someone from the United States? So clearly the DACA decision, Regents versus um, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, is more about uh, uh, prosecutorial discretion and enforcement about people who are already here. It doesn't have to do, for example, to contrast it with um, the Trump versus Hawaii travel ban case, it doesn't have to do so much with inadmissibility, it has more to do with the power of the president to uh, exercise prosecutorial discretion and what are the policies gonna be surrounding enforcement. Um, another kind of way to think about immigration jurisprudence is, is this a case about congressional power, which would be more like a plenary power case, uh, like, like the Chinese exclusion, or is it more about the president's power? And clearly that's going to in implicate, uh, you know, uh, concepts of federalism, maybe the supremacy clause, etc. And so this is definitely about what can the president do with respect to uh, exercising the take care uh, clause. And then, uh, or in this more specifically, what can the president do in terms of rescinding a prior uh, policy of a prior president? Uh, and then the last, the last thing, uh, the last kind of way to think about immigration jurisprudence is, is this a case about federal power versus state power? And if you, if you're familiar, if you guys remember in 2012, the Arizona versus United States case, where the Supreme Court dealt with that very issue. In other words, the question there was, okay, what ability do states have uh, to uh, enforce the immigration laws? And, and predominantly what the Supreme Court said, if you remember, is that uh, for, the, for the, the large majority of cases, the, the power is within the federal government um, and, and maybe in limited ways, the states have the ability to enforce immigration law. The reason why Arizona is a really important uh, decision um, and although, again, it's not expressly discussed in the DACA decision, but if you remember from Arizona v. U.S., the Supreme Court, the justices specifically referenced, quote unquote, prosecutorial discretion. Um, and then they said, as one example of, of an area where definitely discretion should be exercised in a population most deserving of that discretion, uh, that was students. And so that was expressly pointed out in Arizona. And so I think that also has a, a part to play, maybe impliedly sub salento, maybe not expressly, but, but be thinking about that when we discuss the DACA decision. Another obvious case that kind of can be thought of in, in the context of the DACA decision, the Regents case, is um, uh, of course my friend Michael Olivas is, is, the, is the world's expert on Plyler versus Doe. And so 1982 case, obviously Supreme Court strikes down the state of Texas's attempt to bar uh, children, immigrant children from public school secondary education. And, you know, I think about that case and when I teach immigration law, you know, I've read it a few times to teach it. And so it, it gives me, you know, the, the it, 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 when, I, when I look at the language there, the language that, that pops out um, and I think is most relevant to the DACA decision is the discussion about um, uh, the fact that treating children, immigrant ch children differently and barring them from education necessarily leads uh, to the creation of an underclass, right? And so that recognition, even back in 1982, that there's a shadow population, uh, that they will have no rights and, and they won't have voting power. Um, and it really, that decision is also so important because it recognizes that this issue about deportability, about enforcement of the immigration laws, it's not a black and white kind of uh, 
uh, binary kind of choice because people necessarily may have paths for relief. They may necessarily may have an ability to rectify or remedy their undocumented status. Um, and then the last one I have to talk about with respect to just setting the stage for the DACA decision would be Trump v. Hawaii. Uh, as you remember, I think it was 2018, uh, Justice Roberts, interestingly enough, Justice Roberts, again, uh, he wrote the DACA decision, he also wrote Trump v. Hawaii. Uh, in that case, the, the court said that Trump does have the power to ban certain classes of immigrants under the statute. And that was also a statutory case, uh, 212F, which is the, uh, the portion of the INA, the Immigration Nationality Act, says that basically the president by proclamation can determine uh, if certain immigrants are detrimental, detrimental to the interests of the United States. And, and what Justice Roberts said there was that the, the statute exudes deference, exudes def deference. And as we will see, the DACA case turned out not as favorably for President Trump uh, in the agency in question, as, uh, which is DHS, as did the travel ban case. So I think that pretty well sets up a little bit about what you might have in mind when you're thinking about and kind of um, analyzing the, the decision. So uh, I'm, I have about 10 more minutes. I'm going to try to um, discuss this uh, in terms of the little bit about procedural history and then hit uh, the, the decision itself and then a little bit about the aftermath. So as we all know, DACA was rolled out in 2012. Um, basically, it provides for a two-year period of lawful presence, has various requirements, very strict requirements about, uh, you know, basically being in school or, or being a graduate or, or being in the military, uh, and then certain, uh, you know, bars, uh, uh, you know, prohibitions on getting the, the DACA grant uh, based on, uh, you know, even, even minor criminal uh, uh, convictions or criminal history can, can knock you out. Um, it also provides, very importantly for most people, for work authorization. So that's the issue, a two-year period of work authorization and lawful presence. And during that period, you get a reprieve, quote unquote reprieve, from uh, deportation. Uh, importantly, it is not a pathway towards permanent residence. It is not a pathway towards citizenship. Um, in 2014, um, there was a challenge. Now, this is interesting because to, under to really understand the decision, you have to understand that the challenge in 2014 by the states uh, against the, 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 the president's policies at that point didn't have anything to do with DACA 2012. What it had to do with something called DAPA, which was an expansion of DACA. So interestingly, in 2014, they didn't challenge the underlying authority of President Obama uh, related to DACA. They challenged the attempt to expand it. And um, you know, if we had more time, I could talk more about DAPA. Um, there, there was a lot of litigation surrounding that. Obviously, uh, you know, Judge Hainan very famously uh, issued a decision basically striking DAPA. But again, not DACA 2012, but the expansion. Uh, then it went up to the Fifth Circuit. Um, eventually, uh, there was a split decision uh, from the Supreme Court. Uh, that 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 it enabled the Fifth Circuit's decision to stand, and so suffice it to say that DAPA did not fare well. But the, those decisions, and this is important to to understand the full context, those decisions didn't say anything about the underlying um, ability of of the president, in that case President Obama, to to roll out DACA. Um, skipping ahead to September 2017, as we know, the Trump administration attempted to rescind the DACA 2012 program. Uh, uh, then acting secretary of DHS Duke um, promulgated a memo saying that DACA was illegal. And that was really based on the threat of litigation based on the prior Fifth Circuit's decision on DAPA. So that, that is very important because they're basing it on, uh, on the threat of litigation and, and she references DAPA, but, there, but again, there's never been a determination that DACA 2012 was a violation uh, of the APA or, or a violation of the Constitution. Um, uh, basically, what happened then is um, the, 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 there were several lawsuits uh, that, that, that then were filed by plaintiffs in order to uh, attack the rescission, in order, in order to attack it. So I, I talk about this. I have a, a, a law review article called Legal Consequences of DACA Rescission. So I would um, encourage everyone to take a look at that if you want more details about those, those, uh, those efforts to attack or challenge the rescission. Um, 
basically, it's important to, to point out, interestingly, all three lawsuits, um, all three lawsuits turned out in favor of the DACA plaintiffs. So those were the Regents case uh, from, uh, from uh, California, the Battaglia Vidal case from the District of Columbia, and then the NAA versus uh, DHS. Um, all of them rejected the Trump administration's arguments that there was no judicial review. And, and again, that's what uh, the government was arguing. And then two out of three found that the equal protection claim was adequately stated. Um, and importantly, um, there was another uh, decision uh, that, uh, or another rescission explanation uh, where uh, then DHS Secretary Nielsen basically provided another legal justification for the rescission, uh, but she declined to disturb Duke's rescission and explained why she thought Duke was correct. So the Supreme Court deals with both of those uh, uh, justifications, first the Duke justification and then the, um, the memorandum from DHS Secretary Nielsen. So very quickly, the decision. So the decision really can be uh, uh, separated into two parts, right? Judicial review and then whether the rescission was lawful. Importantly, this is very key, the decision does not relate to the underlying uh, legitimacy or legality or constitutionality of the DACA program. Um, so understanding that, the only two issues were, remember, this is an appeal by the Trump administration. So what they were arguing and, and the questions presented were, were twofold. One, does the Supreme Court have the ability to even review the, the rescission? And they argued, no, basically they have carte blanche, they can do whatever they like. And then number two, the question is whether that rescission was lawful. So we know, uh, and again, it's very, you can take a look at the decision, very well discussed by Justice Roberts in, in the plurality. But they, the court soundly rejected the, the notion that there was unlimited power, unlimited power uh, on the part of the president to, to rescind. And so uh, basically finding very clearly uh, and expressly that there was judicial review. And then with respect to rescission, uh, the court then says this was arbitrary and capricious. So it really goes down to a statutory um, determination under the APA that the way it was done uh, was, was arbitrary and capricious and violative of, of the APA. And, and most importantly, and, and I also wrote about this as well, most importantly, Justice Roberts really picked up on something that wasn't brought out very much in the oral arguments, but, but he really did a good job, in my opinion, by pointing out, wait a minute, there's reliance interest here. There's very, very, very important reliance interest on the part of DACA recipients that uh, Duke, first Duke, and then Nielsen failed, just completely failed to uh, pay any attention to. Um, so now uh, I think because I don't, I'm limited in time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over you know, the, the concurrences and the dissent by Thomas Alito, Alito and Gorsuch. Um, but let's, let's think about in the last couple of minutes, I think I have two more minutes, let's think about the aftermath. Okay, so what, what now? So, Obviously, and expressly from the decision, uh, we know that uh, with respect to the underlying DACA program, the court expressed no opinion, okay? So it doesn't mean that DACA is constitutional. It doesn't mean that DACA is unconstitutional. That's subject to remand. That's subject to future litigation. Um, and so what now is the, the, the aftermath? So a couple questions uh, arise. Does USCIS, which is the agency uh, that adjudicates these cases, accept new applications? Do they grant advanced parole or, or continue with renewals? Um, and then number two, what does the agency do now um, and how quickly do they act? So we know a little bit about what what's the agency's position is now because obviously the Supreme Court's decision was June 18th. Um, a district judge on July 17th uh, in a case Casa de Maryland versus DHS, on July 17th, the court held that the pre-September 2017 DACA program must be reinstated um, due to the Supreme Court's decision uh, and, and acknowledged that it was vacated, the rescission was vacated due to the Supreme Court's decision. So now a lot, of, a lot of commentators said, well, wait a minute, the agency has to accept new DACA applications because of that interpretation from the district court and, and, and the way that that played out. However, we thought that was what would happen. But then on July 28th, there was a policy memo issued by DHS that explained that it would reject 
all initial DACA requests. And it seems, it appears to me, that that is a violation of the Supreme Court's decision. Um, and so that'll be subject to further, further litigation. You can look it up online. I won't go into the details about why or what the concerns were um, with respect to the DHS's reasoning, why they th thought that they could uh, circumvent the Supreme Court's decision, but it's a very fascinating read if you uh, Google the July 28th uh, and look up the July 28th uh, memorandum. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions after Professor Morales, or maybe Professor Morales will have questions for me, um, and I'll turn it over to him at this point. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Um, no, that was great. And you did a really nice job setting up sort of the broader picture, so which I'm going to then build on here. So um, I'm going to talk about a case called DHS v. Thoracagium. Um, I hope I got that right. Um, but uh, the case is very technical in a particular way, but I, and we're going to go through some of those technicalities. Um, but the, when push comes to shove, this is a case about procedure, and it's a case about whether the Constitution sort of protects immigrants um, and their right to access procedure. Um, uh, so, so that's kind of the big picture here. So, so what was the issue? Well, um, Thurisidium um, was Sri Lankan Tamil, when Tamil is an ethnic minority in uh, Sri Lanka that has a very well-documented history of persecution. And so um, Thurisidium um, crosses into the U.S. Um, out irregularly, meaning not at a port of entry, so others would refer to it as illegal entry. Um, and once apprehended, um, he says uh, he's um, uh, he says he's seeking asylum, and he tells uh, the border patrol, "Hey, yeah, you know, I was um, I was beaten and tortured and put into these white vans." Um, so not a ton of detail, um, but that's what he tells them. So so then what happens? Well, the border um, the border officers um, reviewing his what's called credible fear claim for asylum decides that this isn't enough to move him into the sort of lengthy asylum process where there's time to put together materials, potentially get an attorney, um, and put together a real case for asylum. So he then enters what's called expedited removal um, under uh, a statute here, um, and this is a 1996 statute, 8 U.S.C. 1252 E2. So this statute had not been used very, uh, not a ton until really the Obama administration. And it's part of the story of Obama's crackdown on um, immigrant communities and his efforts. Um, uh, so he says, of course, um, to show sort of enforcement seriousness in order to get um, a deal in Congress. Um, that uh, would allow for DACA recipients to have legal status as well as regularize the rest of the undocumented population. That plan did not work out for reasons that you probably know if you followed politics in the last um, 10 years. Um, and so um, he nonetheless sort of set this precedent of using expedited removal quite a lot to sort of speed up the rate of deportations and allow the administration to process more deportations. And this is part of the reason why immigration advocates um, called him the deporter in chief. Anyway, so Thurisidium gets onto this expedited removal track, which basically um, you know, means he's gonna be leaving the country very soon. Um, the, uh, his, he gets attorneys, the attorneys file an emergency habeas corpus petition on his behalf. Um, basically seeking access to um, access to um, new procedures where he can present his asylum claim and alleging that the um, DHS officers that conducted the credible fear interview violated the statutory terms of the credible fear statute, right? So this is, here we are. So 
so it, this is, and, and this is why I wanted to give some, some big line context first, because it's, this is about habeas. This is the great writ, right? This is what, you know, the oldest writ in the land. Um, you know, this is part of the Magna Carta. Um, you know, this is, and the constitution of course has a clause called the suspension clause. And the suspension clause says that the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended, but for uh, you know, a very narrow set of emergencies that usually happen by statute, okay? Over time, the suspension clause has been read um, to protect sort of a core amount of access to habeas corpus proceedings, okay? And habeas corpus, another point of history, and this is partly why this was um, a kind of a shocking decision for some, is that habeas has been one of the primary means by which historically non-citizens have sought um, to challenge immigration laws as applied. So all those cases Jeff was talking about, like the Chinese exclusion cases, um, Yik Wo v. Hopkins, all these sort of banner cases that we all teach in immigration law, those all come up procedurally on a habeas corpus petition, okay? In the modern era, however, Congress has consistently sought to strip the role of the federal courts in reviewing immigration decisions. And so our current reality is a um, much more administrative law setting and administrative adjudicative setting for immigration proceedings, whereas in the past, and really um, before the 90s, um, district, federal district courts played a role in reviewing um, various immigration petitions. Um, and of course, the appellate courts, as they still do, but more narrowly, um, uh, played a role. And so what's the big picture result of that? Well, the administrative state is much more invested in deportation and immigration enforcement and much less invested in the rights of immigrants, right? Because those rights are super inconvenient because, oh my gosh, you've got to keep this guy in the country for a year and a half and you've got to, you know, give him all this process. And by the way, he could abscond during that period, right? And so, and, and, and I say this, this, is, this predates Trump significantly, um, this phenomenon of um, a sort of really, um, really, uh, uh, I would say kind of, uh, low grade procedural protection. Okay. So what do we have then, right? In this era of, oh my gosh, like, you know, you, you, me, Tamil refugee, Thurisidium, I'm crossing the border, you know, to try and get asylum, right? I get picked up 25 yards into the border. And, you know, these guys say, okay, well, you know, do you have any claims to assert? And so, you know, he says he was abducted in Sri Lanka, he was tossed in vans, um, you know, which, and he said he was Tamil, right? And if you know anything, and the State Department country reports say this, if you're Tamil in Sri, Sri Lanka right now, you have problems. And if you're getting tossed in a van, it's probably because you were being persecuted, okay? So, so the core here is that under any kind of fair procedure, that ought to be enough, or this is what the lawyers are trying to say, that ought to be enough for this unsophisticated person to get more process, right? And get a real asylum adjudication heard, okay? But because of expedited removal and because of choices the Trump administration has made to close off ports of entry and to sort of make asylum the right way harder to access, right? you have this situation where the great writ becomes sort of the last guarantor of appropriate process in asylum. And note, of course, that, you know, while immigration law is very contradictory in terms of what Congress wants, there's this whole asylum regime that Congress has very specific statutes about procedures that are followed, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the U.S. since World War II has had a robust commitment to asylum uh, relatively robust, I mean, as these things go, right? Uh, we've taken a lot of refugees, your governor in Texas, you know, Texas itself has taken in many, many, many refugees in the last 30 or 40 years, right? 
Okay, so that now we're, that's a lot of background and I promised myself I wouldn't give that much background, but now to the meat of the case. Okay, so the majority holds that, um, that the that thoracidium is not entitled to relief in habeas corpus. Okay. Um, and they hold that based on what I would call a very stingy view of the history of the habeas corpus right. So um, the court um, says that, and, and, you know, and this gets to the stinginess of it, um, the court says that plaintiff himself, the residuum, has conceded that the only possible way habeas could save him here is if in 1789, at the moment of founding, habeas was understood to provide the relief that he seeks. Okay, and then what the court says is they characterize, uh, because habeas, by the way, right, if, what is habeas? Habeas is really have body, right? Habeas corpus, I have the body, show the body, right? So it's a way of attacking um, um, confinement um, by the state, okay? And so the normal, sort of the classic remedy in habeas is release from state enforcement, right? So from, from, from being in jail or being in custody, okay? So, so, so how does the court get to saying that this is not going to fly for thoracidium? Well, the court says in 1789, um, thoracidium is not seeking release. He's seeking to remain in the country lawfully. Okay, so you could really quibble with this characterization and the dissent does, um, but that's what they say. Okay, so he's not seeking release. And so that is not consistent with the writ in 1789. Okay, um, and moreover, the case law that Jeff and I were talking about, uh, or that I was talking about earlier, but that Jeff alluded to, which is that um, all these cases about non-citizens come up on habeas, including cases at ports of entry, by the way. Um, the court says, well, in those cases, um, the immigrant uh, or the non-citizen had been entered in the United States and was being held after entry. Okay, so they make this distinction between entry, like an immigrant who has been admitted entered the United States, and an immigrant who is, quote unquote, still at the threshold, okay? So this is, you know, if you want to teach about legal fictions, this is a classic legal fiction, but it's one that's functioned for, for hundreds of years in immigration law, which is being at the border is not being at the border. <laughs> so case law, for example, um, and statute sort of defines the border zone as within 100 miles of the US, which, of course, as you know, in Texas, encompasses a lot of Texas. Um, so in any case, they say, you can't have this writ for two reasons. One, you're not seeking precisely the right relief. And the only kind of relief you, you could, you, 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 the relief you need is to be permitted to stay in the US and we can't do that, right? Based on the writ in 1789. Um, and then of course, um, you're also, uh, they distinguish this whole other line of case law by saying, oh no, but that's for people who have already been admitted sort of ignoring a bunch of other realities. Okay, so that's the basic, that's the core holding, no habeas in, the, in these circumstances. All right, now hopefully, and I would love to hear what Jeff thinks about this, hopefully that will be read somewhat narrowly. Um, and you know, the court allows for that possibility. On the other hand, it does seem to signal a sea change for the following reason, which is, the court sort of gratuitously decided to also rule on whether due process applies at all. Fifth Amendment due process applies to um, immigrants, quote unquote, at the threshold at all. And for that, they held, guess what? It doesn't. And that, I think, really raised a lot of, of, of hackles in the immigration community when we read this. Um, and that's because as I always say to my students, immigration law is a constitution-free zone for the most part. You know, all the normal constitutional restrictions don't apply. And frankly, you know, when Trump rolled around in 2016 and started 
you know, doing all these novel things with immigration law, uh, there was some hope in the community that old precedents that really sort of established this constitution-free zone would be overturned just because of the express racial animus of the president in many cases um, and because of um, how aggressive the actions were and how without historical precedent they were. But they have not. They've mostly, you know, and I think DACA even fits into this in a sense because, you know, DACA was an APA case. But on the big constitutional questions, the courts have upheld 19th century law for the most part, or sort of Cold War era law, um, or, or sort of, you know, and, or just reaffirmed those and not extended some of the cases that provide more immigrants' rights um, that have, the, like Placencia and some other cases. In any case, so they held too that, that non-citizens that have not been admitted, i.e., in, you know, he's 25 yards in the border, he crossed unlawfully, that the only process that he is entitled to is the process that Congress puts forward, okay? Which is a classic pl plenary power formulation, but it's one that has been chipped away at with a number of other decisions over the years. So that plenary power with respect to the due process clause has been a little bit you know, less strong or so we thought. This points us in a direction that um, I think many of us had not foreseen in the immigration community and certainly puts a placeholder on the fact that Alito is open, I think, to more challenges to due process rights in these settings. But as far as the holding goes, at least under the facts of this case, unlawful entry, you know, very close into the border, very brief period of time, the court said due process equals not what the Constitution says, but what Congress says. Um, and, and whatever Congress says is the process equals due process. So that was, again, um, sort of an alarming uh, thing in the immigration community that happened in this case. So um, I won't talk a lot about the dissents, although they're wonderful. Um, I think Sotomayor's dissent, um, she's been on a roll with her dissents. Um, and uh, Justice Kagan joins Justice Sotomayor in um, dissenting in this case. Um, but her, her dissent, I, said, I, I would call sort of a bluff calling dissent. Um, she goes into extraordinary detail um, about the Great Writ um, and how it evolved over the course of American history, its traditional um, uh, role in challenging immigration disputes. And I think her most persuasive argument is that um, the suspension clause did apply in that era, right? In the 19th century era that Jeff and I were talking about. So, and, and here I'll get a little bit in the weeds. This is a little bit of a nerdy conversation, but it might be interesting to some of you. And so there's this dispute between Alito and Sotomayor about whether or not the suspension clause was at issue in those 19th century cases or whether the statute uh, Congress put forward was more generous than, uh, the, the habeas statute that is, right, was more generous than the contemporary version which is sought to strip jurisdiction, okay? And what she points out is that in the 19th century as today, Congress has been trying to keep the federal courts out of immigration. And what the federal courts have done in response is, oh, guess what? We get to interpret your statutes and we're gonna interpret them in light of the suspension clause and basically interpret them in this incredibly restrictive way such that we can still assert jurisdiction. Why? Well, in the context of big constitution free zone that is immigration law, upholding this basic amount of due process, right, is super important. And so the courts have pretty consistently aggressively and aggressively narrowly interpreted um, these statutes. And the same was true in the 19th century cases, okay? Um, and so basically what she says is, Alito, you're reading these cases wrong, or at least self-interestedly, because there's no way to look at this statute that Congress passed in the 19th century and say that the court was just interpreting the words of the statute. That's not what was happening they were interpreting it narrowly in light of the suspension clause. Now the trouble is, as with a lot of older decisions, the court had many more cases back then, 
and they weren't as specific about what they were doing. And so they didn't use the magic words, we're interpreting this case um, narrowly um, to avoid, it's the constitutional avoidance canon, to avoid this suspension clause issue. And because they didn't say those magic words for Alito, well, that means the suspension clause was not happening right now. And, and I thought Sotomayor did a really excellent job about pointing out why that was a really stingy and implausible reading. Um, and so I'll close with this. You know, what is this case really about? And I think if you read between the lines of Alito's dissent, I mean, I have to read this because it's a little bit shocking. You know, I mean, you have to understand like uh, these asylum claims, um, and I mean, I think especially on the facts of what's happening in Sri Lanka, you know, it, there's a lot of violence there. There's a lot of specific violence against Tamils. And so here's what Alito says um, about, and this is about um, him asking or not for release and whether the government agrees he should be released or not. And he says the following, quote, while respondent does not claim an entitlement to release, the government is happy to release him, provided the release occurs in the cabin of a plane bound for Sri Lanka. I would argue that's incredibly disrespectful and dehumanizing language. And I think, you know, uh, whether or not what's in Justice Alito's heart, I don't know as well, I, don't, I have no idea, right? On the other hand, I know that um, that at least signals that the justices themselves, um, or maybe particularly Alito, but but also um, his his mem the members in the majority, um, are not taking seriously the sort of life or death risks that asylum law deals with on a daily basis. And when we're taught, you know, to la to kind of make a joke about. This guy going back to Sri Lanka where, you know, whatever the merits of, of the procedural argument um, that Alito puts forward, and I think reasonable people can disagree about that, um, it is not small stakes here. And in fact, there's a footnote that basically says on the, you know, once he, this guy got a lawyer, oh yeah, this guy was persecuted. And by the way, he probably does have a really serious credible fear. Nonetheless, that footnote exists, and then you still have this kind of language. And so Alito is much more in favor, and there's other language peppered throughout the opinion. On the one hand, I don't think he takes as seriously the sort of threat of violence that the asylum statutes protect. Um, and on the other hand, he takes really seriously the government's need to sort of process these folks and get them out of the country. Um, and that he doesn't really seem to think that the constitution ought to be a big impediment to that process. So, so I think that piece is kind of scary, that posture, and certainly in this context. Um, where this will go, I think we'll all have to see. Yeah, I, I, I have a couple points. I'm very briefly, I have three points in sure. response to what you said. I think that was a, a great recitation, very well. Uh, I agree with uh, I agree with 99%. Uh, I, I think most of our number one, you pointed out something that I should have mentioned with respect to DACA, which is the DACA decision is really uh, part and parcel of this trend, the turn to administrative law, right? Turn to administrative law. We've seen that um, in various cases, but especially in the DACA decision, because it's all about the APA. Mm -hmm. And that's something, like you said, five, 10, 20 years ago, that was not the case. Number two, keep it short, um, I do take issue with this, this, it's a constitutional free zone uh, area. In other words, immigration law is not constitutionally free, right? You have a lot of aspects of, con of constitutional law that do still play a part and have uh, some efficacy. And number three, I just have to point this out, and I know you saw this in the decision, um, guess what? Enemy combatants get habeas. Right, right, right. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. So this yeah, is interesting. I think that should should be yeah. mentioned uh, and how well, the court and, and, dealt and that, with that. Yeah, no, you're right. And and the other point there, and and I know Dean Baines is is itching for us to get off, um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, and and I think though what that points to though is that it's not at all clear that you know Boumet Yen, the decision you're alluding to, is going to go anywhere. Or, or it might aggressively retreat, right? Um, and it certainly seems that Alito is signaling he doesn't agree with St. Cyr, by the way, which is also established precedent that um, 
you know, habeas applies. Lastly, on the con constitution-free zone, I hear you. When I say that, I, I mean it kind of dramatically. And I, I, what I mean is, you know, the normal rules don't apply, right? It's a little bit Alice in Wonderland. Yes, there are rights. Yes, you know, we fight for them every day and you fight for them every day. Um, but they are not as robust. And plenary power does give Congress a lot of leeway to do things like race discrimination, for example, um, that we would not tolerate in other areas of law. But point well taken, Jeff. Thanks so much. I have one question that says APA question mark. Administrative Procedure Act. And yes, I know that, but I don't know what it's. I think she's maybe. asking, what does it mean, Administrative Procedure Act? Ah, uh, OK, great. Uh, you know, we have, we're, uh, is, are there any other questions I would ask? Um, we're running a little bit of time, but it'd be great to have a little bit of audience participation. If not, we can go to the next panel. Someone asks a question. Thank you for the coverage, DACA, great result, but goes not to the merits at all. And we still have a very scary situation with respect to individuals seeking asylum. There's a grave danger to the upholding of human rights and the makeup of the SCOTUS gives me zero relief. So it's a comment more than a question. Okay. I share your fear. Wow. Thanks, Dean, for inviting us. Well, thank you. I think it was a very vibrant conversation. You can see we have such a fabulous immigration stable of faculty members here. They're really amazing. And we're very, very thankful for um, sharing your expertise with us today. So thanks so much. Thanks so much. And let me turn to the next panel. Uh, well, it's actually one panel member, one person. And let me introduce him. So it's Professor Teddy Rabe. Uh, he is also the George Butler Research Professor and a Associate Professor of Law. Uh, he writes and teaches in the area of civil procedure, complex litigation, constitutional law, and election law. His scholarship focuses on the problems of governance across a range of institutions. He's a publishing phenom. He's published in a wide variety of leading law journals, Harvard Law Review, California Law Review, Duke Law Review, Georgetown Law Review, Vanderbilt Law Review, among many others. Uh, he's also been uh, uh, quoted in popular press, such as the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, NPR, Houston Chronicle, and he's a sought after speaker at some of the top law schools, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, NYU, Duke, UCLA, among many others. He's won our university-wide teaching excellence award, and he's also a member of the American Law Institute. Let's welcome Professor Teddy Ray, who's gonna be talking about election law issues, specifically, I believe, the faithless or faithful electors is my understanding, right? Depends and that's on very important right? as we move into this presidential election year. So take it away, Professor Rabe, and I will disappear. Um, well, thank you, Dean Baines. Um, so uh, as the Dean said, I'm going to talk about uh, Chiafalo against Washington, which is the faithless elector case. Um, so uh, as we all know, uh, the president and vice president are chosen by the Electoral College, uh, not by popular vote. Um, but the actual mechanics of this process are, are, are really quite arcane. Um, the, the mechanism is pretty clunky. Uh, lots of people think it's on, uh, and typically the, the main objection you hear uh, is to the allocation of electoral college votes, uh, which of course gives more voting power to small states than to big states. Um, and twice in the last five elections, the loser of the national popular vote went on to win the electoral college uh, and therefore the presidency. So we hear constant calls for reform uh, to shift to something that looks more like a national popular vote, uh, either through a constitutional amendment uh, or more recently through a, a, a workaround like the national popular vote plan. Um, but the framers of the constitution uh, didn't trust the populace to elect a president directly. Uh, and so they built a, a rather elaborate system uh, to allow state legislators uh, to appoint electors who would then go on and vote for president. Uh, and some of the framers uh, expected those electors 
to exercise independent judgment and right? a sort of a civic Republican model. We're going to pick the best people uh, and they'll make the best decision for all of us. Uh, so Alexander Hamilton and John Jay uh, wrote in the Federalist Papers, for example, that uh, electors would be the most enlightened and respectable citizens and they'd be capable of analyzing the qualities needed in a president uh, and that they deliberate before making choices that uh, reflected their discretion and discernment. Um, but one thing that, that Hamilton and Jay and the other framers didn't anticipate was the rise of political parties. Uh, and the electoral college system uh, essentially broke down by the third time it was used and had to be totally revamped with the 12th Amendment. Um, so the, the, the way it works uh, is basically this. Uh, each state uh, is allocated the number of electors equal to the number of representatives in the House that it has plus its two senators. So you can see the overrepresentation of, of small states because they uh, get the senators uh, as well as the, the House uh, of Representatives which are allocated on a population basis. Um, and those electors are appointed uh, in such manner as the legislature of each state may direct. Uh, and then the electors, once they're appointed, meet in each state in December, so a month after what we typically think of as election day. Um, and then they transmit their votes for president and vice president to Congress, which then counts the votes. Uh, a, a person who wins a majority of the electoral votes, so 270 votes today, uh, becomes president. And if no one gets a majority, then the House of Representatives picks the president from among the top three candidates. Uh, but when the House does that, they vote a state with each state and getting one vote. So again, overrepresenting uh, small states. Um, in every state, so, so as I said, the Constitution says that the state legislatures decide how the electors will be appointed. Uh, in every state, uh, the legislature has required a popular vote for president. Uh, and in every state, the party whose candidate wins that popular vote gets to choose who the electors are, uh, with the expectation that the electors will then go on uh, and, and vote for their, the, that party's candidate. Um, I should note here that Maine and Nebraska are a little bit more complicated, uh, but not in a way that's important to this case, so I'm just going to ignore that so I don't have to explain how they're different. Um, so that's the basic system. Let's fast forward to the, the 2016 election, uh, which, as some of you might recall, was a little bit contentious. Uh, so Hillary Clinton, the popular vote, uh, both Washington and Colorado. Uh, so then under Washington and Colorado state law, uh, the Washington and Colorado electors were pledged to vote for Hillary Clinton when the Electoral College met. Um, and, and uh, 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 Hillary Clinton, of, co uh, of course, lost uh, in, in states making up a majority of the Electoral College. Um, but uh, lots of people at the time didn't want Donald Trump to become president. Uh, and most people, in fact, if you look at the, the national popular vote total. Uh, and so uh, a handful of electors uh, concocted this scheme. Uh, electors from Washington and Colorado uh, and some other states uh, attempted to persuade electors from states where Trump had won uh, to defect and vote for someone else. Um, these electors knew that the electors to Trump uh, to vote for Clinton herself. Uh, but what they hoped to do was persuade enough electors to vote for third parties that it would deprive Trump of an outright majority and thus throw the House, uh, throw the election into the House of Representatives. Um, and again, they had no hope that the Republican House would pick Clinton as president, uh, but they did hope that the compromise candidate would be someone other than Trump. Uh, so even though they were pledged uh, uh, and required by state law uh, to vote for Clinton because she won in Washington and Colorado, uh, a handful of electors from those states voted for Colin Powell uh, and John Kasich. Uh, the scheme uh, ultimately led nowhere, uh, so the electors who were pledged to Trump stayed firm. Uh, only two electors, only two Trump electors ultimately defected, uh, notably both were from Texas.
the problem for these, uh, uh, for these electors though, and, and what led to the case here, uh, is that both Washington and Colorado have laws that punish such faithless electors. Um, faithless elector laws are actually pretty common. So 32 states have laws that require electors to vote for the candidate who won the popular vote in that state. Um, and 15 of those states punish electors who fail to vote as they've pledged to do. Uh, so the most common sanction is to immediately remove a faithless elector uh, from, the, uh, from his or her position and then substitute an alternate elector uh, whose vote the state then reports uh, so it comes out the right way. Uh, and that's how the system in Colorado works. Um, a handful of states also uh, or instead impose monetary fines on faithless electors. Um, and so Washington imposes a thousand dollar fine uh, on faithless electors. Um, and the way this case got teed uh, electors who had not voted for Hillary Clinton uh, were fined and they challenged their fine, arguing that the constitution gives the electors uh, discretion to vote as they see fit. Um, the electors were, were represented by Harvard law professor Larry Lessig, uh, who saw this case as a vehicle to, to essentially try to blow up the electoral college. Um, so basically Lessig figured that if he could get the Supreme Court to hold that the constitution guarantees electors the right to go rogue, uh, then that might help galvanize support for a constitutional amendment abolishing the electoral college uh, in favor of choosing the president by national popular vote. Um, and at the very least in Lessig's view, the question would be settled outside of the context of a contested election. Um, so the plan didn't work out so well. Uh, so he wrote justices, uh, and Justice Thomas concurred uh, with Justice Alito joining him. Um, just a, 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 a quick side note here. Um, I've long thought that Justice Kagan is the best writer on the Supreme Court, but her opinion here, I, I think it's a little bit too cute. Uh, though not in a way, hopefully, uh, that, that is disrespectful of, of the litigants, as uh, Professor Morales was suggesting uh, with the last case. Uh, to to the, uh, the, the musical Hamilton, which I thought, you know, was, was justified. Um, but uh, I, I think maybe referring to, to President Jefferson's role as President Adams' vice president, uh, as fodder for a new season of Veep, that, that probably goes a little too far into the, the camp uh, direction. Anyway, I digress. Um, um, so, 52, a case called Ray and Blair, uh, the Supreme Court had upheld Alabama's faithless elector law, uh, though this case was a little bit different because the Alabama law just required the electors to pledge to support their party's candidate. Um, it didn't include any sort of sanction if they violated that pledge. Um, so in that sense then, uh, this was a fairly easy case. Um, once you accept that states can require electors to vote for the candidates that they're pledged to, um, it, it's hard to really see what's wrong with including mechanisms to enforce that pledge. Um, and that's pretty much how the court's reasoning went. Uh, so the court said Article One, Section, or Article Two, Section One of the Constitution uh, gives state legislatures the power to appoint electors in such matters they see fit, uh, and that power includes. Um, and uh, quoting the court here, nothing in the Constitution expressly prohibits states from taking away presidential electors voting discretion as Washington does. Uh, the Constitution is bare bones about electors. Uh, so to quote Justice Kagan again, that is all. Um, but I think it does raise the question of what the Electoral College is for if it doesn't give electors the power and discretion to vote their consciences. Um, uh, it seems like an awfully complex way of tallying votes, if that's uh, uh, all it's intended to do. Um, and the electors uh, had argued that the Electoral College is supposed to do more. 
Um, so they argued that when the Constitution calls them electors and tells them to vote by ballot, uh, those terms require them to exercise their own uh, independent choices. Uh, that's inherent in the nature of voting, uh, to, to make a choice. Um, but the Supreme Court rejects that idea, uh, saying the text doesn't require it. Uh, so Justice Kagan tells us that it still counts as voting, uh, even if you always vote the way your spouse tells you, or your employer tells you, or your union tells you. Uh, it counts as voting even if you cast a proxy vote on behalf of someone else. Uh, and indeed, Justice Kagan goes pretty far down this road uh, when she says that even a Soviet-style election with only one candidate on the ballot, uh, even in that sort of election, the voters still cast votes. Um, so even though voting and discretion are usually combined, the court says, voting is still voting when discretion um, Now, the electors, uh, you know, text aside, had a, had a pretty good argument that the framers envisioned the Electoral College to play a more important role uh, than simply tallying up the votes. I mean, certainly Alexander Hamilton thought so. Um, uh, but the court rejected the framers' expectations that electors would exercise independent judgment. Uh, so Justice Kagan uh, wrote, whether by choice or by accident, uh, the framers did not reduce their thoughts about electors' discretion to the printed page. Uh, all they put down about the electors was what we have said, that the states would appoint them and that they would meet and cast their ballots to send to the, the capital. Those sparse instructions took no position on how independent from or how faithful to party and popular preferences the electors vote should be. Uh, on that score, the Constitution left much to the future. Um, and uh, it's a consistent practice of founding uh, has shown that electors need not have discretion. Uh, this part of the court's opinion, I think, is, is a little bit weaker, where, where the court starts to reason from uh, past practices. So quoting James Madison, uh, Justice Kagan says that a regular course of practice can liquidate and settle the meaning of the Constitution. Uh, and then she explains that electors have only rarely exercised discretion in casting their ballots. Um, Fair enough, I guess. Uh, but if elector discretion is supposed to be a, a, a safety valve of sorts, uh, say to prevent a, a clearly unfit person from taking office, uh, then you would expect it to be rarely used. Uh, and in fact, 180 electors have cast faithless votes uh, and Congress counted all of them. Uh, so arguably, past practice direction. Um, but even if Justice Kagan's uh, liquidation from past practice uh, doesn't settle the original meaning uh, or rule out a, a discretionary role for electors that, that Hamilton envisioned, uh, I think it does reflect a, a sort of realism about the role of political parties uh, uh, in our democracy. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to pause for a second because I see a bunch of comments here uh, that uh, maybe the sound is coming out, going in and out. Uh, is this better? Is it, is it working now? I guess it's hard in this format for people to respond. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and jump back in and continue, uh, but uh, perhaps Ed or Tanisha can, can let me know if there's uh, something we can do. Um, all right, so as I was saying, uh, just a, a more realist view about uh, the role that political parties uh, play today. Um, so the, the, the Constitution was silent on the role of parties, uh, and the framers tried very hard to prevent their emergence, uh, but they failed pretty miserably on this score uh, and soon found themselves at the heads uh, of competing parties. Um, and ever since then, electors have been chosen on a party basis. Uh, so, so from the very beginning, uh, electors were chosen for, for their pledges, uh, not for their judgment. Um, and uh, uh, as Justice Kagan says, the, the 12th Amendment cements that partisan understanding of the role of the Electoral College. Um, so uh, the original Constitution had let each elector cast two votes for president, 
uh, with the top two vote getters becoming president and vice president, respectively. Uh, and the idea behind this, presumably, was that choose the two. Um, but that turned out to be a total disaster. So the election of, of 1796 ended with bitter rivals, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson as president and vice president. Uh, and the election of 1800 ended in a tie between Thomas Jefferson and, and Aaron Burr. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so the 12th Amendment changed that procedure uh, and set it up so that electors vote for a party slate uh, of president and vice president. Um, and before long, uh, if, as, we, as we go into the, the nation's history, uh, the electors themselves faded into the background. Uh, so legislatures got out of the business of directly appointing electors uh, long ago in favor of holding uh, elections. Um, and candidates for elector aren't even listed on the ballot anymore in most states. So when people go to vote, they vote for the presidential candidate uh, and the winning party then picks the slate uh, of electors who are pledged to the winners. Um, and I think this is probably the strongest argument uh, in favor of faithless elector laws today. Uh, nobody votes for electors to pick a president for them. Uh, no one even knows which electors they vote for. Uh, to, to, to let electors who people didn't even know they voted for go rogue uh, would undermine the legitimacy of the presidential election. Uh, certainly through modern eyes, uh, and, and even to, to, to some voters in 1796, as, as Justice Kagan points out. Um, and electing electors to make a choice for the voters uh, goes against modern uh, realist democratic theory. Um, so uh, the, the framers, of course, didn't try popular and, and modern political theorists largely agree that voters are ignorant um, but the Hamiltonian response of giving discretion to the electoral college uh, is exactly backwards as a response um, so people are, are rationally ignorant about most of the issues that they're voting on uh, and most of the candidates that they're voting for people have more important things to do in their lives than be glued to, uh, to c-span um, uh, but to think that voters are going to be better at choosing largely anonymous electors uh, than they are at choosing a president uh, is ludicrous. Uh, so you'd have to be hiding under a rock not to be able to tell the difference between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, uh, or Joe Biden for that matter. Uh, but I'd bet no one, uh, no one here today has any opinion at all on whether Chris Suprin or John Harper would do a better job of picking a president. Um, both Chris Suprin and, and, and Harper were, were Texas electors in, in 2016. Uh, Suprin actually went rogue and voted for Kasich. Uh, Harper voted for Trump. Uh, so the court rejects the idea uh, that electors are gonna play some civic Republican role uh, uh, in choosing the best president. And instead it goes in, in the, the realist direction and recognizes the role that political parties play in our democracy, uh, even though the constitution is silent on them. Um, that direction, uh, the court says, uh, accords with the constitution as well as with the trust of the nation that, that here we the people rule. Um, and it lines up more with, with what the public thinks and would find legitimate today uh, than what the framers desired in 1789. Um, just a, a, a couple uh, more thoughts before I open it up to questions. Um, first, I think this case would have been a much bigger deal had it come out the other way. Uh, so many people feared chaos if the court held that electors were free agents. Uh, so, uh, so just imagine that one candidate wins the nat national popular vote handily uh, but only wins states with 268 electors, while the other candidate carries states with 270 electors. Um, this is hardly an implausible breakdown. Uh, the, the pressure to get a couple of electors to flip, I think, would be tremendous. Uh, and you could certainly imagine norm-defying candidates openly lobbying electors to switch. Uh, or worse, uh, with the stakes so high, you might even have to start worrying about 
candidates or, or outsiders bribing electors to, to switch their votes. Um, and I think this, this chaos or potential of chaos was actually part of Professor Lessig's thinking in bringing the case. Um, a Supreme Court holding that electors or wilds who are free to wreak havoc might help galvanize support for a, a constitutional amendment abolishing the Electoral College uh, in favor of a national popular vote. Um, I'm maybe a little bit less worried about that sort of chaos than some other commentators. Um, we had the, the potential for similar chaos at the Republican National Convention in, in 2016. Uh, so the Republican Party elites uh, had the formal power to change the rules uh, surrounding delegate voting and counting in a way that could have blocked Donald Trump's nomination. Uh, but even though lots of Republican elites at the time uh, vehemently opposed Trump, they never pulled the trigger on that. Uh, they, they just couldn't go against the wishes of the Republican electorate that chose Trump in the primary elections. Uh, a last minute change like that would have lacked legitimacy and, and, and would not have likely been accepted. The Electoral College uh, seized the role that Hamilton envisioned for it. Uh, and after the people's votes were in, uh, rejected the choice that the voters made, uh, the results wouldn't be viewed as legitimate. Um, popular elections, uh, not elite control, are just too ingrained uh, in our thinking today. Uh, and, and so it's hard to really imagine many electors actually making that kind of a choice. Um, now, perhaps the risk of a, of a handful of rogue electors is greater than the risk of, a rogue, of, of rogue party bosses. Um, but if the Supreme Court had held that electors were free agents, uh, I think the pressure to appoint staunch loyalists as electors would have been very, very strong. And the, the people least likely to defect would have been the people uh, appointed. Uh, but again, I think that uh, this just highlights the anachronism of the institution. Uh, why not confirm that the system works the way everybody thinks it works? Uh, when you vote for president, you're really voting for president. Uh, your vote is weighted according to the Electoral College formula, but uh, you're not choosing someone else whose name you might not even know uh, to make that decision for you. Uh, and so the court's holding eliminates uh, at least that potential for chaos. Uh, electors are not free agents and states can require them to vote for the winner of the popular vote uh, in that state. Uh, but the court's holding does leave open the potential for another form of chaos. Uh, so what happens if a candidate dies between election day uh, and uh, the, the day of the electoral college vote? Uh, again, this is not an entirely implausible scenario when we have two candidates in their 70s in the middle of a pandemic. Um, Washington law would require its electors to vote for the deceased candidate. Um, the court recognizes uh, this possibility and, and then ducks it. So the court leaves open the question of whether laws binding electors to vote for the dead candidate uh, would be constitutional in that situation. Uh, though the court hints that uh, the solution probably lies elsewhere uh, and that it thinks states would probably release electors from that pledge if the, if the situation arose. Um, one final thought. Uh, uh, so one really good thing about this case is that it was decided now uh, outside the context of an election. Uh, so I think if the outcome of the contest between Trump and Biden hung in the balance, uh, the court's decision about whether faith faithless electors are bound by their pledges uh, could lead to a, a full-blown constitutional crisis. Um, so uh, it, it's always important to have clear rules going into elections. Uh, and so at the very least, uh, this the, the court's in this clarify those rules. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to, to take questions. I think we'll just give just a moment for people to actually type their questions if they have any. Sounds good. I'll ask you a question. Okay. So do you think that there should be a constitutional amendment to abolish your electoral college? 
should or will? Should and will. Sure. Let's answer both. <laughs> yes sure to both. And, and not a chance. <laughs> Um, you know, this is one of those things where, uh, as I said, the Electoral College is an anachronism. Um, and I think that the court's holding in this case sort of recognizes that it's really, the Electoral College is really about uh, allocating voting power among the states and overweighting the votes uh, of less populous states. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a, a, a political compromise that we see elsewhere in the Constitution. The Senate does the same thing. Uh, other parts of the Constitution that we've changed, thankfully, like the three-fifths clause also did the same thing. Um, and so the, uh, you know, we can argue about whether that is uh, anachronistic. Um, I think it's hard to defend uh, just from a, a democratic theory standpoint. Um, and I think most people think that uh, everyone's vote should count the same. Um, but, you know, there, there, are, there are, are important uh, historical reasons why uh, that compromise came out the way it did, and I think there are, are defensible theories uh, for why I want to make votes differently. Um, but part of uh, weighting those votes differently, I think, makes it very difficult to change because there are clear losers uh, in a constitutional amendment, um, and there are more losers than it takes to block a constitutional amendment. So I, I would not think that changes uh, likely anytime soon, uh, unless we had a, a real crisis um, uh, that, that, would, that would get everyone on the same page. And you know, part, I, like I said, part of Professor Lessig's uh, motivation for bringing this case was to spark that crisis. A very, uh, uh, not very risk averse way to, to try to change the constitution. But what it does do, you know, is that it encourages the candidates to really campaign mostly in the swing states. So states that they know they're generally going to win, you know, because they're heavily Democratic or heavily Republican, the part they will basically ignore, even though they may be big states with big populations like, you know, Texas, maybe, you know, Texas or New York or California, for instance, usually fall in that category. But if it's another state that, you know, where the electorate is, you know, divided and swings back and forth, you know, they're focused just on Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, to some degree, Florida, et cetera. And so it does seem as though, I hear what you're saying, but does it seem, seem as so that there are, you're not really getting the interests of the whole country uh, necessarily discussed or evaluated, at least at election time, it really is just those narrow, that narrow window of whatever 10 or maybe now it's 13 states, I think this time it will be. I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? So I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that at all. I don't think that helps us get any closer to, to actually amending the constitution. Um, but you know, in any way that you design the electoral rules, they're going to have an impact on how candidates campaign and, and what policies are enacted. It's, it's really hard to, to separate out that process from, from the substantive uh, results. Um, and so, you know, you see in, it, lots of swing states are farm states and you see lots mm -hmm. of, you know, historically lots of support for farmers. Um, and you could say that that's a distortion uh, or you could say that actually that that was sort of the point, um, and like I said, I I would I would much prefer a, a system where we have a national popular vote. I mean, we have one office in this country that's elected nationwide. I would think that everyone should get to vote in that, and that everyone's vote should count equally in that. Um, but but it's 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 hard to get there from here. I think. I guess the other thing is I think President former President Obama in his um, eulogy for uh, Congressman Lewis indicated that maybe one of the solution is having Washington DC and Puerto Rico made states. Um, I don't know what your thoughts on that. So, so for the audience, Teddy, Rave and I usually talk politics all the time. So, so, I, so I just- But, but we, I, we've been distant. We've been distant, exactly. So we haven't had a chance to talk. <laughs> um, questions in the Q&A. Maybe, maybe we should take a few from the Q&A? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Um, so what do we have here? So it's interesting that most states, I think 48 are winner take all by simple majority, leaving the possibility that 49% of the voters may really have no voice. 
are my thoughts correct? I guess that's the whole issue with respect to, um, you know, the case that dealt with um, political um, uh, representation, a little bit, I guess. With respect uh, to a, a little bit. I think this, the, mm -hmm. this question is going at a, at a different phenomenon here, right? If you have a, a winner take all allocation, you know, say you have 20, your stake 20 electors, um, and uh, the, the vote goes 51% for Democrats, then the, uh, and the state is, is it, so then the 49% Republicans get no electors. Um, and that's really up to the states, how they wanna allocate their electoral votes. Um, and actually early in the country's history, a lot of states did it proportionally. They did it by congressional district or by county or, or some other way so that the, the electoral votes from the state would be split uh, to reflect the, the voting breakdown. Um, but what happened there, and again, it, you know, the, 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 the process affects the outcome, which affects the policy. Um, big states like Pennsylvania uh, allocated their votes proportionally and small states like Rhode Island or Delaware allocated their votes winner take all. Um, and that skews the outcome towards what the smaller states favor. Um, so if Texas were to unilaterally say, we're gonna go, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it proportionally, um, you know, in recent elections, Republicans would win somewhere between 55 and 60% of the electoral votes um, but Democrats would get a huge, uh, a huge boost in, in the outcome. Um, and, uh, it, you know, states that, that allocate their votes uh, on a winner take all, allocate their electoral votes on a winner take all basis, uh, end up having more power working together. Sure. Second question, what would you describe as a real crisis which would spark the need for a constitutional amendment? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, th this is uh, th this is just a, a imagining a parade of horribles, right? I guess you know maybe maybe what uh, the the scenario Professor Lessig was envisioning, um, uh, if we had uh, an election uh, uh, this fall uh, with candidates, we can hypothetically call them Biden and Trump, uh, and. Biden wins overwhelmingly in the national popular vote uh, and Trump gets 270 electors uh, and therefore wins the presidency, or at least that's what we think on election night. Um, and then there's, there's huge lobbying uh, to get a handful of electors to switch and that happens and Biden goes on to win or, or it gets thrown to the House of Representatives and someone else wins. Uh, I think there'd be a lot of soul searching after that election. And I think you, if, if when, when, you, when you see something break down like that, uh, that's the kind of situation where you can get a, a, a consensus to, to change something like the, like, like the electoral college. I mean, that'd be interesting, I uh, think. Uh, certainly, I'm sorry, that would be interesting, I think. But you know, the challenge, of course, is you say it's a question of power, you know, and who has the power, who keeps the power. You, that were to happen, you know, the question is like who wins and who loses is would be part of the issue. And we've now had within the past 20 years, actually 16 years, two situations, two elections, presidential elections, where the popular vote diverged from the electoral college vote, um, which is sort of significant. And it possibly, as you point out, could happen again uh, at some point in the future. So that does raise issues. But you know, people may not want to change it for the obvious reasons. Last question though, is there any truth to the assertion that the Electoral College is a result of the three-fifths compromise, meaning is the Electoral College tied to slavery? Um, so I'm not a historian and I know that historians argue about this question. Um, so I don't, I don't want to weigh in too much on what uh, what the historical evidence says about 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 the the link between the two, but I can tell you about the effects, um, and the effects are are absolutely um, so uh, uh, the the first I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna get the number wrong uh, the 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 vast majority of the early presidents were southerners, 
um, because the, the three-fifths compromise did give uh, the southern states uh, more uh, representation in the House of Representatives uh, proportional to their population than the northern states, um, which, you know, by the, the electoral college formula translates into more electoral college votes. Um, I don't know that that was the reason that they used that formula and actually the, you know, the putting the senators into the formula is probably has, has more of an effect than, than the three fifths compromise. Um, but like I said, I, I haven't, I haven't looked at all the historical evidence to, to really be able to weigh in on that. But it does raise the issue that, you know, it, 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 it to be more blunt, you know, it had three fifths clause where African Americans couldn't vote, weren't, weren't considered citizens, but their share of the population, at least three fifths of, of three fifths of it, was included in the uh, representation of the House members, which was then included in the Electoral College. So, as, as Professor Rave said, it does have a disproportionate impact uh, with respect to the Southern states, especially back then. And now, sort of the same, sort of similar issue. Uh, to some degree, I guess, with respect to where the representation sort of lies and how people vote. It's maybe not necessarily um, specifically based on the historical premise, but its effects still may be somewhat similar. So I want to thank Professor Rave. Thank you so much. It's great talking politics with you. We'll have to do a podcast on it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So next, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is, hold on for one second, if I can pull it up, is uh, Johnny Rex Buckles. And uh, Johnny Rex Buckles actually was on the Dean Search Committee that um, uh, when I was hired. Uh, he's been a faculty member at the Law Center for almost 20 years. He currently holds the uh, professorship named after Mike and Teresa Baker. It's a Mike and Teresa Baker College Professor of Law. He served as visiting professor of law at Washington Lee University School of Law. He's taught taxation of exempt organizations, federal income tax, law and theology seminar, estate planning, trust and wills, contracts, tax policy seminar, among other courses. Professor Buckles, you are busy. Professor Buckles' primary research is in the area of uh, law of tax and charity and law and theology. He's published law review articles in legal journals, including the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, the Fordham Law Review, the Indiana Law Review, the Maryland Law, Mer Maryland Law Review, the Arizona State Law Review, many, many, among many others. And he has a case book, co-author of a case book, uh, fifth edition on state planning law and taxation. And he's gonna talk about the two, the cases dealing with President Trump's uh, tax returns, both from the standpoint of the uh, Congress and whether they have the ability to subpoena it, and also from the standpoint of the Manhattan DA. So let's welcome Professor Johnny Rex Buckles. Thank you, Johnny. Thank I'm you, Dean. Disappear. And good afternoon. I have the privilege of summarizing a couple of cases involving the issuance of subpoenas seeking financial information on the president and his affiliates. I'll tell you my plan for the afternoon. I'll first summarize the cases and then explore them in more detail and as time allows offer a bit of commentary on important themes in the opinions and i'll be focusing probably just on the majority uh, opinions although although there are some dissents the first case is trump v vance it involved a subpoena served by the new york county da on the personal accounting firm of president trump and in this case the court held that the president is neither absolutely immune from state criminal subpoenas seeking his private papers, nor is he entitled to a heightened standard of need. So must the president just sit helplessly in the Oval Office uh, and fumingly watch his accounting firm hand over his tax returns? Not quite. First, the court uh, also held that a president may avail himself of the same protections available to every other citizen. Now that in and of itself is hardly surprising for one does not typically sacrifice fundamental rights uh, just by assuming political office. But the court also and more interestingly concluded that the president can raise 
subpoena specific constitutional challenges, uh, challenges that wouldn't be available to an ordinary citizen. So we need to look at this aspect of the holding in more detail later. Our second case, the Trump v. Mazars case, is uh, one in which the court set forth standards for evaluating the propriety of congressional subpoenas seeking the president's personal information. The subpoenas were issued by, count them, three committees of the U.S. House of Representatives. The Mazars opinion holds that in assessing whether a subpoena issued by a congressional committee and directed at the president's personal information is related to and in furtherance of a legitimate task of the Congress, saying that the courts must take into account the separation of powers principles at stake, including both the legislative interests of Congress, which are significant, and also the position of the president, which is unique, uh, by considering four factors at least. So I will refer to this holding as the four plus factor test. We don't know exactly what all might be in the plus, and I will unpack it for you in this presentation somewhat. In holding this way, the court rejected alternative tests proposed by the president and by the House of Representatives. So let's take a more detailed look at each case. First, Trump v. Vance. Here are the facts. In 2019, acting on behalf of a grand jury, the New York County DA's office served a subpoena on Mazars, the accounting firm President Trump uses for his businesses and presumably for his personal returns as well. The subpoena directed Mazars to produce financial records relating to the president and business organizations affiliated with him, including tax returns and related schedules. Uh, dating all the way back to, to 2011. Uh, the president sued the DA uh, and Mazars in federal district court for declaratory relief and to enjoin enforcement of the subpoena. He argued that a sitting president enjoys absolute immunity from state criminal process under Article II and the Supremacy Clause. The president lost in district court, lost in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit as well, and it reached the Supreme Court. I've already told you the bottom line here, the bottom line being that uh, the court held the president is not absolutely immune from state criminal subpoenas for private documents, and also that a state prosecutor need not satisfy a heightened standard showing uh, of need for the documents. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the majority opinion, and it's interesting, if not entertaining, to see how he got there. For Roberts begins with a history lesson surrounding the man who killed Hamilton in that most famous of American duels, Aaron Burr. The opinion first draws on the trial of Aaron Burr, not for murder, but for treason. The trial was no ordinary one, and it's not just because it involved the charge of treason, but also because the illustrious Chief Justice John Marshall presided. He was acting as circuit justice for Virginia. And in the trial, Burr moved for a subpoena directed at President Jefferson for the production of a letter from Louisiana Territory Governor James Wilkinson. I know this sounds sort of like a, a soap opera uh, for the founding generation, doesn't it? Although the prosecution opposed this, Justice Marshall ruled that the president does not stand exempt from the general provisions of the Constitution, or specifically, from the six amendments guarantee that accused have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses for their defense. Marshall rejected the idea that the president's duties as chief magistrate demand his whole time for national objects, uh, as though the president just doesn't have the time to worry about responding to a subpoena. Marshall also rejected the prosecution's argument that the president was immune from a subpoena ducis tecum because executive papers might contain state secrets. Uh, the rest of the story of the prosecution of Burr, uh, who was acquitted, adds not that much to the analysis. The bottom line is that Jefferson was willing to comply with the subpoena except as necessary to protect public safety. And in the opinion of Trump v. Vance, uh, the court recites how numerous presidents have accepted Marshall's ruling in responding to subpoenas. So what did President Trump's team argue was sufficient to distinguish his situation from these others? 
Well, they involved federal criminal proceedings. And the Mazar subpoena was issued in a state proceeding. Team Trump argued that the Supremacy Clause gives a sitting president absolute immunity from state criminal subpoenas because compliance with those subpoenas would categorically impair a president's performance of his Article II functions. Now, the Solicitor General chimed in as well, uh, arguing something different, though. On behalf of the United States, the Solicitor General uh, argued that a state grand jury subpoena for a sitting president's personal records must at least satisfy a heightened standard of need. Uh, and then the Solicitor General contended that that was not satisfied. Now, the president's absolute immunity argument rested on three legs, diversion, stigma, and harassment. And the court just rejected them all. Um, the court rejected the argument that complying with the state criminal subpoena would necessarily divert the chief executive from his duties. Uh, perhaps a bit tongue in cheek, the court observed that uh, it had already rejected immunity based on distraction in the Clinton case, uh, which involved civil liability. Um, and furthermore, the court said that a properly tailored criminal subpoena would not normally hamper the performance of the president's constitutional duties. R remember that in, in this case, it wasn't even the president himself who was issued the subpoena. And the court noted that the Trump was seeking immunity not because of, of any distraction occasioned by the prospect of future criminal liability, uh, but just from complying with the subpoena. Uh, and that ran up against, as the court said, 200 years of, of precedent. Um, the court is fond in these cases of speaking in very long terms, centuries, uh, if not decades. As to stigma, the court opined that there's nothing necessarily stigmatizing about a president performing a citizen's normal duty of furnishing relevant information in, in a criminal investigation, uh, and also saw no stigma on other grounds, uh, also pointing to grand jury secrecy. And then as to the argument that uh, subjecting presidents to subpoenas would render them targets for harassment, uh, the court again brought up the Clinton case and saying we basically rejected the, the notion there would be undue harassment there. And the court also said that the law protects against abuse in a number of ways, including typical safeguards surrounding grand jury uh, procedures, as well as under the supremacy clause that prohibits state judges and prosecutors from interfering with the president's official duties. As to the heightened uh, showing advocated by the US, uh, the Solicitor General wanted to require uh, this threshold that uh, the evidence sought is critical for specific charging decisions and the subpoena is a last resort, um, meaning evidence is not available anywhere else. And the court just disagreed for a number of reasons. Uh, the first being that uh, this heightened standard would extend the protection that is designed for official documents to the president's private papers, uh, and that's contrary to Justice Marshall's opinion in the Burr case, uh, among other reasons. So wh what is left for the president in challenging the subpoenas? Well, first, the, the president can just challenge uh, them on normal grounds, grounds that any other citizen could, so things like bad faith, undue burden, breadth, breadth uh, that's too extensive, uh, the court pointed out that high respect must be given to the office of, of the chief executive in uh, timing and scope of discovery. But, but then maybe more interesting, the, the court's roadmap for the president uh, also indicates a, a tailoring to the office of the presidency. The court says that the president is not relegated just to these uh, ordinary remedies, but a president can raise subpoena-specific constitutional challenges, even in a state proceeding. So he can challenge the subpoena as an attempt to influence the performance of his official duties, because that would violate the Supremacy Clause. Uh, he can also argue that compliance with a, a subpoena in a case would impede his constitutional duties, uh, incidental to the functions confided in Article II is the power to perform them. 
And so um, if the president can show a conflict between a judicial proceeding and his public duties, or can show that uh, an order or a subpoena would interfere with his efforts to carry out his constitutional duties, then that changes everything. The majority opinion by Chief Justice Roberts was joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Um, Kavanaugh, joined by Gorsuch, filed a concurrence. Thomas and Alito filed separate dissents. Second case, the Mazars case, involved uh, three committees of the U.S. House of Representatives issuing four subpoenas for information about the finances of President Trump, his kids, and their affiliated businesses. So we've got one by the House Committee on Financial Services. They issued two subpoenas on Deutsche Bank and on Capital One relating various financial information, account activity, due diligence, foreign transactions, a whole litany uh, of items. The House Intelligence Committee, chaired by Adam Schiff, uh, issued a subpoena to Deutsche Bank as part of an investigation into foreign efforts to undermine US political processes. Yes, the House Intelligence, Intelligence Committee wanted to investigate Russia interference in the 2016 election. Sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? And then the uh, Oversight Committee of the House uh, issued a subpoena to the personal accounting firm, the Mazars firm, demanding financial information related to the president and several affiliated businesses dating back uh, from, from 2011. So the president, the Trump clan, and their business affiliates filed two suits challenging the uh, subpoenas. One was in the district court for DC, the other was in the Southern District of New York. Uh, they argued that the subpoenas lacked a legislative purpose, a legitimate legislative purpose, and that they violated separation of powers, sought declaratory judgments and injunctions preventing the accounting firm and the banks from complying with the subpoenas, and they basically lost everywhere, and so it went up to the Supreme the court vacated uh, the judgments below and remanded the cases to be decided in accordance with the court's standards, uh, which according to the court reflected a balanced uh, approach accounting for the separation of powers. The chief wrote the opinion again. Everybody joined this one except for Justices Thomas and Alita who again filed separate dissents. So in handling this case, the court approvingly cited its precedent that each house has the power to secure necessary information in order to legislate, including issuing subpoenas, but there are limits. The short version is the subpoena must serve a valid legislative uh, purpose, so it must concern a subject that is uh, appropriate for legislation, but that's not all. Congress may not issue a subpoena for the purpose of law enforcement, nor can it expose just for the sake of exposure or punishment, uh, repeating a standard from prior cases. Uh, recipients of subpoenas also retain their common law privileges and, of course, constitutional rights and privileges. Now, stating those general standards, the court then took up uh, first the president's main argument uh, and quoting the Nixon case from the Watergate tapes, the president argued that the House has to establish a demonstrated specific need uh, for the financial information, just as the Watergate special prosecutor had to do that in order to get the tapes. But the court in Mazars said no, it declined to extend the protection for communication subject to executive privilege to cases involving non-privileged pri private information like the president's financial info. Uh, by definition, this does not implicate sensitive executive branch deliberations. And to subject it to that standard, said the court, would impede Congress in carrying out its responsibilities, legitimate responsibilities, and would be a significant departure from longstanding political precedent. Uh, however, the court did not agree with the House either. Relying on precedents concerning investigations that did not target the president's papers, the House urged the court to uphold its subpoena simply because they related to a valid legislative purpose or concern a subject on which legislation could be had. Uh, but the court said no. The court opined that the House approach fails to take adequate account of the significant separation of powers issues that are raised by congressional subpoenas for the president's information. The court observed that the two branches have an ongoing institutional relationship 
its opposite and rival, their political branches, and they're established as such by the Constitution. And congressional subpoenas for the president's information pit the political branches one against the other, according to the court. Uh, the court felt that the House's approach would aggravate separation of powers concerns and that unchecked subpoena powers would result in uh, the imperious control over the executive branch uh, and alter the historical practice of negotiation between the branches. And so the court set forth what you know, it sort of uh, you know, self-congratulatorily framed as its balanced approach uh, indicating that, that all of these factors that it's setting forth had, had to be considered uh, as part of uh, the separation of powers uh, principle in the Constitution. First, courts should carefully assess whether the asserted legislative purpose warrants the significant step of involving the president and his papers. Uh, that means that Congress may not rely on the president's information if other sources could reasonably provide Congress the information it needs in light of its particular legislative objective. So it has to say what the objective is and, and uh, has to point somehow to evidence that would say it's got to come from the president in order to, to serve that objective. The court specifically said that Congress may not look to the president as a case study for general legislation. Secondly, to narrow the scope of possible conflict between the branches, Courts should insist on a, a subpoena that's no broader than reasonably necessary to support Congress's legislative objectives. So there's a breadth question. Third, uh, the court says the court should examine the evidence that Congress offers to establish that a subpoena advances a valid legislative purpose. Uh, the more detailed and substantial the evidence of Congress's legislative purpose, the better. So in other words, the court's not just going to take Congress's word for it on this. And then fourth, courts should be careful to assess the burdens imposed on the president by a subpoena. This is kind of interesting because, you know, the court has already said in the prior case that burdens on the president's time and attention stemming from judicial process and litigation without more, uh, generally they don't cross constitutional lines. They're, they're not a problem. But here the court said burdens imposed by a congressional subpoena should be carefully scrutinized. Why? They stem from a rival political branch that has an ongoing relationship with the president and incentives to use subpoenas for institutional advantage. Um, then the court said in a kind of catch-all safeguard, other considerations may also be relevant. Uh, and then the court justified its reservation of the possibility for other relevant uh, considerations uh, by saying that one case every two centuries does not afford enough experience for an exhaustive list. So this is the plus in the four plus factor test. Um, and as, as mentioned before, uh, the chief wrote this one and was joined by everybody but two, Thomas and Alito. Now in the time that remains before uh, a bit of time for questions, I do want to uh, point out some important themes and other observations that I think uh, appear in, in these two cases. The first theme that's important is the court's reliance on tradition and political precedent. In Vance, the court showed how American political history witnessed presidential compliance with subpoenas served in criminal investigations. Uh, it, it traced it from Jefferson through Clinton and remarked that presidents had uniformly testified or produced documents in criminal proceedings. It, it mentioned that in two centuries, uh, you know, it, it loves talking about the court, the opinions seemed to reflect a love for, for talking about vast expanses of time. And, and Vance says in the two centuries since the Burr trial, successive presidents have accepted Marshall's ruling. Uh, and, and then the court points to a number of presidents, uh, Monroe, Grant, Ford, Carter, Clinton. But just as Vance points to presidential precedent, Mazars points to the lack of congressional president, precedent for the actions taken by the three committees of the House. The court in the opening paragraph says, we have never addressed a congressional subpoena for the president's information. 
And it also says, historically, disputes over congressional demands for presidential documents have not ended up in court. They've been hushed out in the, it uses language like the hurly-burly, give and take uh, of the political process between the other two branches. Um, and then the court recounted examples of, of over time, the president and the Congress working things out uh, and pointing out that this case was a significant departure from historical practice. Uh, the practice that has, again, been managed for over two centuries, the court pointed out. Now, it's also interesting that in rejecting the tests urged by both the House and the President, uh, and again, citing two centuries, the court says the political branches have resolved information disputes using the wide variety of means that the Constitution puts at their uh, disposal. And we, the court would just transform uh, judicial enforcement uh, if it followed either approach of the parties. And so together, if you take the opinions together, the tone of the opinions it can be interpreted as, as something of a slap on the wrist for both the House and the President, as though they are children uh, who have failed to heed the examples of their wiser parents and grandparents. The second theme, uh, I think, worthy of comment is this. The President is only the President, but he's still the President. So in Vance, the court opened with these two sentences. In our judicial system, the public has a right to every man's evidence. Since the earliest days of the Republic, every man has included the President of the United States. And discussing the Aaron Burr trial, the, event, the Vance opinion also talks about how the only reservation at common law to the duty to testify in response to a subpoena was in the case of the king. But a king is born to power and can do no wrong. The president is contrasted with the king because he's a man of the people, subject to the law. So Roberts is saying that the president is only the president, not a king. As Harvard professor Noah Feldman recently uh, observed in a Bloomberg opinion piece, I think as he also fondly observed in the opinion piece. But both opinions make clear that the president is indeed the president, and that still means something. So it means, first, under Vance, the president has a few grounds for arguing against uh, complying with subpoena uh, that are not available to just anyone. And it also means, under Mazars, that neither House of Congress is king. Recall that in rejecting the House's test for the propriety of its committee subpoenas, the court remarked that unchecked subpoena powers would result in imperious control over the executive branch. Imperious control is an interesting choice of words. I would say that when you read these opinions, you get the impression that the court wanted everyone to know that neither Capitol Hill nor the Oval Office contains a throne. And then the final thing uh, that I see in these opinions, uh, it's, it's also something of a dual theme. The court is not political, but neither is it naive. So in distinguishing the Mazars case from those that came before, the court placed the case in this context at the beginning of the opinion. It said this, here the president's information is sought not by prosecutors or private parties in connection, in connection with a particular judicial proceeding, but by committees of Congress that have set forth broad legislative objectives, Congress and the president the two political branches established by the Constitution have an ongoing relationship that the framers intended to feature both rivalry and reciprocity. And it cites the Federalist Papers, one authored by Madison in that regard, as well as a concurring opinion in a Supreme Court case, the Youngstown case. But what I want you to observe is how Roberts characterizes Congress and the President. They are the two political branches. And the clear implication is that the judiciary is not one of those political branches. And Roberts also notices uh, the, the rivalry and the reciprocity between those two political branches, the executive uh, and the Congress. You'll recall that you know, he said earlier that even though it, it wasn't too much of a burden for 
the president to comply with uh, a subpoena issued in judicial proceedings, it's, it's possibly different in the case of a congressional subpoena because that does involve a rival branch. We'll, we'll again, note the contrast. Uh, where there's a rival branch concerned, uh, the burden needs to be looked at closely. Where it's a judicial proceeding, uh, we're not worried about the general burden on the president. So the plain implication is the court doesn't view the judiciary in any way as a rival branch, right? So, so what you're seeing is the court talking about how uh, either directly or implicitly how the judiciary stands above the political fray. The judiciary is not part of, of the rival politics. Now, of course, in a fair competition before a rival, uh, between rivals, there is some benefit to having a neutral referee when those rivals spar. And the opinion reads rather like the court sees itself as a neutral referee, albeit one that is reluctant to assume even that role because it wants to stay out of it. But the court also asserts its political consciousness in Mazars. And that's, that's kind of interesting too. The court says this, we would have to be blind not to see what all others can see and understand, that the subpoenas do not represent a run-of-the-mill legislative effort, but rather a clash between rival branches of government over records of intense political interest for all involved. Now, that's interesting. Uh, this may be about as clear as it gets for the court in acknowledging its institutional awareness of the intense politics surrounding a controversy, surrounding this controversy uh, in particular, that's before the court. And, and when the court expresses that it's not going to be naive uh, about this, perhaps there is a hint of warning in its words. Uh, so what am I thinking? A, a warning that in an interbranch dispute like this one, the court, albeit reluctantly, does stand ready to strike down actions that have no real legal justification when pure partisanship uh, could be the explanation for, is the best explanation for those actions. Now, certainly the opinion doesn't go so far as to say that's what the court thinks is going on here, pure partisanship. It's more uh, of a hint that it's watching. And it's the branch that's above the political fray. It's going to referee this to make sure that uh, neither branch has an unfair uh, upper hand in this matter. That's, that's the sense that I take from uh, the language in the Mazars case. Now, I'll tell you what I'll do now. I will open up our time for some questions. But because uh, on our agenda, Professor Berman has uh, only 15 minutes or so. Uh, if we don't have uh, a lot of questions, that's actually fine. I'm sure she could benefit from an extra five minutes or so. So uh, I'll turn it over to the Dean and see where it goes. I'll ask you a question. That was great. Okay. Great recitation of the cases. Very, very interesting. So do you think there would be, so I, I, I appreciate what you're saying that, you know, the rival branches and the concern over the political aspects of it. So two questions, I guess. One, do you think that it would have been different if it was an Im impeachment proceeding, number one? And number two, you know, that it came in the context of the House subpoenaing his records in the context of the impeachment proceeding. And the second question is, do, do you think this applies to things like the oversight? Because there, there have been some complaints and concerns by members of Congress and by the president. I mean, for instance, he wouldn't let Dr. Fauci testify for the House only for the Senate, because he said the House was too political. Do you think it would apply, this rationale of this valid purpose, whatever, would apply for other kinds of things where Congress is attempting to do its oversight function? Mm -hmm. Okay, so on the, on the first question, uh, where, what would happen if this was done pursuant to in impeachment proceedings? Um, that's a great question, Dean. Interestingly, in, in one of his dissents, in the dissent in Mazars, uh, Justice Thomas 
actually took the view that all of this, all of this should have been done pursuant to an impeachment proceeding, if you're going to do it at all, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, do I think then that uh, seeking the information in the context of an impeachment proceeding would be any better? What I'm going to suggest is it, it actually might be a little bit better because at least, at least if Justice Thomas thinks that if there is a forum for it, it's the impeachment forum, okay, mm -hmm. um, that you're, you might get justices more, uh, that, are, that are a little bit more open to what's going on. Um, see, in the case of, of the current context, it's, it's got to be, the subpoenas have to be tied to a legislative agenda of some yeah. sort. Um, and the focus of an impeachment proceeding is, is different, right? So mm -hmm. at a minimum, the kind of showing that would be required is different and is conceivably easier to meet. I mean, let, let, let's face it, um, to, to explain exactly why you need Trump's tax returns um, in, in order to legislate on certain tax reform measures, let's say, uh, is going to be difficult. Uh, now, other ones might not be difficult. Like, um, you, you may be aware that there's actually a, another uh, piece of, legis uh, of litigation out there involving the House Ways and Means. So uh, the House Ways and Means chair, it took him a while, but eventually he sought uh, the president's tax uh, information, tax returns. And it involved the question of, of whether existing law was uh, sufficient to ensure that the IRS would not be too deferential in auditing the president's tax returns. Well, now you can see that's pretty relevant. You can make mm -hmm. a pretty good case, right? That that's a legitimate legislative uh, interest. Now that's tied up in the courts right now in different litigation. Uh, it's, I, I believe it's kind of being, being litigated on a standing issue at the moment rather than on the merits. But I think, I think that your question does uh, give us reason to believe that if this kind of information is sought in an impeachment proceeding, uh, it, it might be easier for Congress to show uh, why it, it needed it. Now, an impeachment seems a little bit more like the, the, DA, the Manhattan DA's case, the New York. Yeah, that's it's right. Criminal in nature. That, that actually, yes. And your question does kind of um, inspire what I would expect to be other questions about this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's probably not the case that we're going we're gonna to get these returns before the uh, election, just, just looking at how long it, it typically takes for these, these cases to work through. You know, some have suggested that if the president wins, then, you know, the Democrats aren't going to care about it anymore uh, and uh, they'll just drop everything. I don't think that's necessarily right. Uh, be, and it's because of your question. <laughs> it's your question about impeachment. I mean, they might give that one another go, uh, even after the election, uh, as, as the cases work their way through. Now, your, your second question in, involved uh, whether this, this, these decisions might provide any guidance for um, general other, oversight. Yeah, other oversight. oversight. Yeah. Yeah, that they want to see whether things are working. Should we have, you know, should we enact legislation for, you know, this, that, and the other? We're doing oversight. You know, we want to talk to Dalek Fauci because maybe we want to, you know, pass our own mask bill, or maybe we want to talk to the Attorney General because. We want okay. to see, you know, Got I mean, it. those kinds of All right. so, IRS director uh, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I think that the, the quickest answer to your question is that it's unlikely that these opinions will have as much of a bearing on that question as other precedents. And the reason is that these opinions, you'll recall, just involve the president's private information. There's nothing here involving his discussions in office. Nothing here involving executive privilege material. So um, in terms of going forward with oversight on those kinds of matters, I don't, I don't think these cases are the ones that would be uh, very influential going forward. We lost you for a second. Those, Louise, uh, these, these cases won't be very influential 
okay. in terms of resolving disputes over House oversight uh, with respect to information that has come up while the president's been in office and pertaining to his mm -hmm. official duties. That these cases are, are really, uh, what, what's fresh about these cases, what's new about these cases, is that they involve the, the president's personal financial uh, information outside and prior, outside of his uh, office and, and prior even to his official. Assumption. And also the thing I think was, which is striking about the cases is that they were also going after his accounting firm, right? Not the records from the accounting firm and some others and not necessarily from him personally. Is that my recollection? Yeah, that's, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. They, okay, so they subpoenaed <laughs> the accounting firm Mm -hmm. uh, they subpoenaed Deutsche Bank, they subpoenaed Capital One. Um, and I think, you know, one of the reasons that they probably did that is to avoid some of the uh, procedural burden arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, now the court, uh, interesting that you brought the point up because the, the court did point out that even though this information was held by third parties, it's still the president's information. So the court analyzed it uh, as though, you know, it, it's, it's everything that's relevant to the president. But I imagine that, that part of the reason they just subpoenaed them is, is you know, as a procedural means to try to maximize lost you for a second. the success. La we lost a few, last few words. You think uh, that to maximize the success uh, you. that they, they could get to it. Good, good. I don't see any Q&A. Does the audience have any questions? Let's give them a moment and see. They may not, and that's okay. okay. So it doesn't appear anything's coming up. Um, so I want to thank Johnny Rex Buckles. Thank you My for pleasure. illuminating and very interesting, very topical uh, discussion of a very important Supreme Court case that sets precedent with respect to you know future presidents and their. Um, relationship with Congress, as well as um, uh, the uh, legal and criminal uh, process. I now want to uh, introduce our last speaker, who's going to tell us all about how all of these cases and everything else that the court did this term, how they fit into sort of the term, how, how she would describe the term, how it fits into um, how people think about the new two new justices on the, the court and were, were people surprised? Were people surprised about the chief judge uh, on the court and, and their actions? And so I want to introduce uh, Professor Emily Berman. She's an associate professor of law. Her scholar, she teaches con law and her scholarship examines the unique separation of powers challenges that arise in a constitutional, statutory and regulatory regimes governing, governing national security policy. She focuses in particular on ways to impose traditional conceptions of government oversight, such as checks and balances and democratic accountability on law enforcement and intelligence operations, where such oversight is frequently absent. Prior to joining the University of Houston Law Center in the fall of 2014, we actually started at the same time. Uh, she taught for two years as a visiting assistant professor at Brooklyn Law School. And she previously was a Furman Fellow and Brennan Center Fellow at the NYU Law School in New York. And held a position at, as counsel of the Katz Fellow, as a Katz Fellow at the Brennan Center, where she developed policy recommendations, drafted reports, and engaged in advocacy regarding US national security policy and its impact on civil liberty, liberties. Uh, she's been published in leading law reviews multiple times law reviews such as the Minnesota Law Review, the Fordham Law Review, the Indiana Law Review, the NYU Law Review, and her commentary and opinion pieces have been found in many, many uh, popular publications such as the National Law Journal, Atlantic Online, Legal Times Online, CNN.com, and she teaches con laws I mentioned, foreign affairs law, and national security law. Let's welcome Professor Emily Berman. Thank you. And I will disappear. Emily, are you there? You're, I am you're, here. You Hello. You don't see your video yet. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Okay. okay. Here, you <laughs> here go. I am. I will, I will disappear and come okay. back. Bye -bye. Um, so thank you very much, Dean Baines, for your kind um, 
introduction and welcome. Uh, thanks to, to all of you for uh, sticking around to, to the bitter end. I know they're, they're holding uh, um, the code you need to get your CLE credits until after I'm done. So um, I know I'm standing between you uh, and, those, um, and those credits. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, I have a few PowerPoints as part of my discussion here. Um, so hopefully um, that has now popped up on folks' um, screens. So somebody maybe tell me in the, in the chat or the questions if, uh, if that's not showing up. Uh, but in general, um, my plan today is to, to step back, as Dean Bain said, and make a few big picture, big picture observations um, about this past term. And, and the, they fall in sort of three different categories, um, sort of general landmarks and statistics from the term, um, a couple thoughts on the sort of general sentiment that seemed to have come out of this term, that, that it was a more quote unquote liberal term than uh, a lot of people had anticipated. Uh, and then finally, some thoughts on uh, the Chief Justice and the outsized role that he played uh, on the court this term. Um, so first, um, just a few landmarks. Um, so there are a lot of firsts this year, the first time the court has um, closed due to a pandemic since uh, the 1919 Spanish flu outbreak. Um, the first time they did telephonic arguments as well as the first time their arguments were broadcast live. Uh, the first time in, in several decades at least that the court term um, expanded into um, you know, my PowerPoint's lagging here. Um, here we go. Um, into July. Um, the last time any court had issued a decision in, in July was 2014. Uh, the last time the court released nine decisions, which they did this term in July, was, was 1986. It was also the fewest signed opinions in um, many, many years. <laughs> um, this is the lowest number since uh, the 1862 term during the Civil War, where the court issued 41 uh, signed opinions. And the prior to that, you have to go back to 1849 to find another term with fewer than 53 signed decisions. So um, one of the interesting um, things people like to talk about is uh, are the 5-4 decisions. Um, and in fact, there are a substantial number of them. We see almost a quarter of the cases were 5-4, but I think people often forget that a substantial number of the court's decisions also uh, are unanimous. So over a third of the cases uh, had no dissenting justices. When it does come to the 5-4 decisions, um, we had um, three separate lineups. Um, one that recurred um, 10 times, that was the, mo the, the five sort of conservative justices together, that was the most common 5-4 uh, majority. And then we had a couple other sort of what folks might call um, unusual bedfellows in, in four cases. Um, one of the most striking statistics from the term is that the chief was in the majority 97% of the time. He only dissented uh, in two cases. Um, this is something that Justice Kennedy did when he was the swing justice uh, three times. Um, and before him, Justice Brennan also did this in um, 1968. The last chief to do so was Chief Fred Vinson uh, in 1949. Um, Justice Kavanaugh was a, a close second there with um, a majority vote in 93% of the cases. Now, um, sort of more qualitatively, um, going into this term, um, it was hailed as a blockbuster, as it was. It, it, it had um, a large number of big ticket cases on hot button issues. Um, and it was poised to turn out to be actually quite a conservative term. We had 
um, you know, the DACA case and abortion and um, LGBTQ rights and gun restrictions and, and all of those um, areas where folks thought that perhaps um, this five conservative member court was, was going to push the law significantly to the, to the, to the right. Um, in some respects, that did not um, pan out. We, as we heard earlier today, the, the DACA decision, the, um, the LGBTQ rights case um, came out in what would someone call the more liberal side. Um, the Louisiana restrictions on abortion law was found unconstitutional. Uh, and the, uh, the gun case that the court had taken up about a New York gun restriction was uh, dismissed as moot. So um, a lot of people describe this term as liberal. Um, and you could, and there were definitely some ways in which that was the case. But if you look at the DACA decision, for example, it confirmed that the president could in fact rescind the DACA program if he wanted to. Likewise, the um, Louisiana abortion case gave sort of a roadmap for, for states that want to impose targeted regulation on abortion providers. And then maybe most importantly in this vein, um, there were several religion cases, which I think in any other term would really have garnered major headlines. Um, but this term um, just got lost in some of the discussion of some of the, the other big, um, big name cases. So for example, so there are three specific um, religion clause cases that I think together signal that this court is, go is it going to be expanding the rights to free exercise of religion um, and contracting um, establishment clause prohibitions on what the states can do. So um, Espinoza was a case in Montana that had to do with a tax credit that parents got if their kids went to private school. And under the Montana policy, you could not get that tax credit if the private school was a religious school. Uh, and Justice Roberts for a 5-4 court here said, no, if you offer this benefit to private schools, you have to apply it to all private schools. Um, and so this seems to indicate um, it's an expansion of, the, of a, the Trinity Church case that people may remember from a few terms ago that was about the funding of a school playground. Um, so it's expanding this idea of um, not excluding from public benefits institutions simply because they are religious institutions. Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe was a two employment discrimination suits brought by teachers who were fired from a Catholic school. And again, um, the sort of more um, accommodating of religion position won out, where the court said that, that the ministerial exception, which was an existing exception to employment discrimination laws that said, um, if, you're, if you're a church or um, a faith community, you can decide who you want to hire as your ministers without being subject to um, any discrimination laws. And here the courts had some role in teaching religion and therefore they qualify for this quote unquote ministerial um, exception. As Justice Sotomayor pointed out uh, in dissent, um, one potential implication of this decision is that this ministerial exception now covers employees of uh, parochial schools, thousands of them, and those schools can discriminate against them on uh, the basis of race or gender or sexual orientation or any of the, the protected classes uh, because they have now been exempted from um, the employment discrimination protections that most employees get. And then the third religion case I want to mention is um, Little Sisters of the Poor, another um, round in the fight over the Affordable Care Act's contraception mandate. Here, um, states had challenged an HHS rule 
that exempted um, employers who had moral or religious objections to contraception from that mandate. And the court said um, they're entitled to do that. And, and Justice Alito went even further saying that he would have held um, that this was not just permissible, but actually required um, by the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, one, one other note about the sort of more sort of conservative side of this term, if you will, is what's uh, sometimes known, oh, sorry, God, I had this one. So with looking ahead to, the, to these religion cases, um, it's clear that, that we have a solid majority for um, a, a broad interpretation of the free exercise clause. Um, and there's actually a case in the coming term that's going to question whether employment dis dis division versus Smith, which is the current rule about free exercise of religion that says rules of general application are not unconstitutional simply because they impose a, uh, an incidental burden on, uh, on religion. And then finally, I just wanted to mention what's often called the shadow docket. So these are non-merits cases like emergency applications, thing that, things that, the come, that come to the court outside the context of have the court having granted certiorari. And in all of those cases, there were um, significant wins for what would be considered the more conservative uh, position. So when it came to um, voting rights, when it came to death penalty, um, when it came to injunctions regarding um, controversial Trump administration policies like the border wall construction and asylum policies, all of those went to on the more sort of conservative side of things. So, um, so I think one, so I think the, the, the fact that this court is often is, is being described as um, more liberal than expected is, is certainly true in some cases, but I think across the board, the conservatives had a much more successful term um, than, than they um, are given credit for sort of um, in the immediate wake of, uh, of the term ending. And then just the last point I'll make um, really quickly is that this was the year that be this became the Roberts court. As I said, he was in the majority in 97% of the cases. He was the deciding vote in many cases. And for many of the big cases, um, took the opinions to, on himself and so was able to shape the way the law is going to move. Uh, and so I think he's very clearly set himself up at the, at the ideological center of the court. And he's the justice that litigants are going to be writing to um, to look for that crucial fifth vote going forward. So um, I'm two minutes over time, so I'm gonna stop there. I'm happy to stick around if people um, have questions uh, that they would like to ask. Well, thank you, Professor Berman, that was great. I have two questions and we'll <laughs> wait to see if anybody has a question. So first question is, you know, there was a lot made of, of uh, President Trump, he had a list of, of of judges who appoint to the Supreme Court, he had his his um, appointees vetted by the Federal Society for the lower courts and also the Supreme Court. And now we, you know, and now we have two judges that didn't appear to go along with what people thought they might go along with on some of the cases. Do you think that one is that can you always so one is is it is it that you can't always judge a book by its cover, as you as our parents probably told us. Uh, number one and number two, I've seen in the press, and that that Roberts is reacting. You know, there's want to make the court overly political, and is reacting to some of the Democrats saying they want to pack the court or change the membership to have more members in case things don't go their way. Do you think so? What do you think of those two things? And then we'll see if any questions. I think there are a couple different things going on there. So one, I think. Um, when it comes to Justice Gorsuch, what we saw this term is that his con commitment to his version of constitutional interpretation, a very strict textual interpretation, um, is a sincere one um, that he's going to stick with, even when, as in the case, as in Bostock, um, the outcome is maybe something that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a conservative outcome. So. Um, 
And similarly, just in the way that Justice Scalia would often come down on the more uh, pro criminal defendants rights from a more sort of libertarian conservative position, Justice Gorsuch is, is like that. Um, one of his interesting votes was about the Native American rights mm -hmm. um, case and that's something that that he has developed that position during his time on the on the Tenth Circuit. So maybe um, an indication that geographic diversity among the justices makes some difference. So I think with Justice Gorsuch, he's just um, a sort of quirky doctrinally, um, and so that's going to throw some curveballs from time to time. For Justice Roberts, I really do think that the institutional reputation of the court is a big um a big factor and and people that know him much you know his his biographer Jumbus Cupic um has said that this is this is a priority for him and you can see it in many of the things he did this term so the Louisiana abortion statute that he that was struck down that was the first time he ever voted against an abortion restriction um, but he did so by focusing on stare decisis and saying, as the court, we don't just decide the way we want to decide, we stick with our precedents. Um, when it came to the Second Amendment, um, apparently, again, according to Joan Biscupic anyway, um, he sort of signaled to his colleagues, I am not a consistent fifth vote for you when it comes to expanding Second Amendment rights, and therefore, let's dismiss this case as moot that came out of New York that was already on the docket and the court passed by a number of other petitions for cert in Second Amendment cases that I think a lot of people had thought they might take up. So, and then with the, the Trump tax cases, he sort of allowed, he came up with a, a decision that allowed both cases to declare victory, right? Like nobody got the, the, the documents they were looking for immediately, but they do have the right to ask for them. And so each side could say, we got a little bit here and we're gonna live, we both live to fight another day. And so I think, I think all of those um, are indications or um, outgrowths of the chief's desire to keep the court as apoliticized uh, as he possibly can. And given that he is the, both the ideological center and the chief, and therefore determines who writes which opinions, that um, gives him a lot of control over not just how, not just you know where the court ends up, but how how it gets there. Um, and he's made made use of that this term. Um, yeah, and we can imagine he'll make use of it going forward, um, so long as Justice Ginsburg hangs in there. You have a couple of questions. So first one. Can you expound on the conservative? Oops, when it moved. Can you can expound on the conservative decisions, and especially with regard to why many conservative observer, observers now decrying the Roberts Court as a failure on the part of conservatives to create a conservative Roberts Court, as opposed to the centrist many believe that Roberts has become? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know there are people who are very disappointed in some of Justice Roberts' votes. Uh, I think the DACA case, I think the Bostock case um, in particular, um, I think a lot of conservatives said, okay, we have five appointees, now we get to win, right? Um, and didn't take into account that, in fact, the Supreme Court, while a political institution is not as much of a partisan institution as the other branches of government are. Um, and so who appoints you, um, the cat's tail in the way this, um, who appoints you to the court is not necessarily going to dictate the outcome. And so I think the people who are making those arguments are really disappointed at specific outcomes. But I think if you look at Justice Roberts' decisions, you know, yes, he came out um, against rescission of DACA, but he didn't say that the federal government couldn't rescind DACA, just said it hadn't done it correctly. Um, similarly with the abortion law, he, he said this falls because of stare decisis, but if states want to 
restrict abortions in certain ways. Here are all kinds of ways that are not precluded by stare decisis that they might be able to do that. And then again, as I said in the, um, in the religion cases, you know, that's a very solid majority. I think, it, I think employment division versus Smith, which is the case that says the government can impose generally applicable regulations um, and everyone has to abide by them, including religious institutions, uh, including people who have religious objections to those rules, so long as the intent was not to burden the free exercise of religion. Um, and I, I think those days may be numbered for, uh, for that case and that and the, the court might revert back to, um, Smith was from 1990 and, and the doctrine before that said that anytime there's a burden on religious exercise, the government has to meet strict scrutiny. So it wouldn't surprise me um, if, if that was how they came down on that case next term. So, uh, so I think, short story long, I think some of the sort of liberal or centrist outcomes were more um, case specific issues rather than an indication of Justice Roberts, you know, conservative or liberal leanings. He is still very much a conservative jurist. Or maybe our, where our country or the court is has moved so that what we're seeing as centrist might be perceived to be conservative, potentially. Sure. I mean, Justice Stevens said that, right? He said, when mm -hmm. I got on the court, I was, I was conservative. <laughs> I didn't change. But the court shifted right. to the right, and I became a liberal. <laughs> but yeah. so it's all um, a matter of perspective, I suppose. So one last question um, from Audrey. Hi, Audrey. Uh, is there any truth to the court to the court observer comments that justice is lean justices lean more liberal the longer they are on the court, and could this be a possible culprit of Roberts' moderate move? Huh. Um, you know, I. Um, not, I don't have the statistical knowledge to, um, to definitively come down on that. I mean, I think that, um, and there's a great website for those of you who are interested in this kind of, this kind of thing called Empirical SCOTUS that keeps those kinds of statistics. So it may well be that they've got something about that on the website, but, but I, I suspect that it's more that society and therefore political uh, electoral winners and therefore appointees have become more conservative over time. And so, like you said, what, what is considered sort of centrist or mainstream, you know, when the, when the Affordable Care Act was being debated, the idea that the, that the mandate was unconstitutional was was silliness, according to you know most people in the academy, and that ar that argument went from like completely off the wall to being with to to getting five votes, basically the commerce clause version of it anyway, mm -hmm. uh, over the course of of that that debate. So, so I think what we could, what we see is centrist um, shifts and has shifted um, to the right in the past several decades. Um, and so that might be why judges that are on the court tend to be more to the left of their more recently appointed colleagues. That's great. Well, I think that's, I think we've kept our audience quite some time. <laughs> You've done a terrific job. All the panelists did a terrific job. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> I see in the chat and also in the Q&A that people are thanking us and saying how wonderful it is. So I really want to thank all the panelists and all the participants for their hard work in preparing for this especially Tanisha Green, who's our director of uh, CLE and Sonder Tennessee, among other, many others. So thank you all. Um, so, uh, Tanisha will be in touch. I, Tanisha, you have the, um, I guess you put up the, um, the, uh, the course material on what people need to do. So I think we're all ready to go, right, Tanisha? We are. Just, um, just really quickly, if you have not already done so, the QR code is there. Take your phone camera, scan that, and it'll take you to directly to the Texas State Bar um, reporting page for this course. If you don't want to do that, the code is 
1740093393 and you can uh, report by either of those means and that's it i'll leave this up until we okay. end the program well i think the program is over <laughs> no i mean until we close until we close, close out okay. <laughs> but i want to thank i want to thank all of our panelists um Absolutely. i want to make sure i hold on for a second i get it right and i have to i can't have to figure out how to get out of this thing <laughs> so i can see now that oh here we go uh oh. we didn't want to do that takes a full screen okay and so let me thank all the panelists so i want to thank uh, judge steve kirkland and victor flat who were the panelists on the first panel for their discussion of uh, the EOC and LGBTQ issues in Supreme Court. I want to thank Daniel Morales and Jeff Hoffman on the second panel, looking at uh, asylum cases and DACA cases in the immigration area. I want to thank uh, Teddy Rave, talking about faithless electors in the Electoral College. Many thanks to Teddy Rave. Many thanks to Johnny Rex Buckles, who talked about Trump's tax return and the subpoena, subpoena for them by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and the House of Representatives. And many, many thanks to our, our last speaker, Emily Berman, for her overview of the Supreme Court's term. So we at the University of Houston pride ourselves on doing really great conferences and events and CLEs like this. Please make sure that you tell your friends about it and we will have additional workshops and conferences over during the course of the year. So many thanks to all of you for coming and have a good weekend. Thank you so much.